<laughs> I wonder if you know how they dress in Tokyo. If he write it, then you read it, then you know he no nigo. I'm a tora. <laughs> trip, trip, trip. I'm a tora. <laughs> trip, trip, trip. Throw gang, we were joined by the nonfiction pharaoh, the imam of Ivy. Last name marks no Carl, so you know he cop in that capital, and the production is mean. Like serving a dude martinis, we got this guy, Jin. He got status and culture, you a small foused vulture. Pen floating on the page, that's a Tokyo drift. He dropping bombs in Amitora like Torah, Torah, Torah. He no Nigo, you no weak hose. Oh, he's a Japanese translator? Bet. Oh, you don't fuck with cultural critics? How about you cultural <laughs> critical these nuts? His whole life with W, he can't even pronounce L's. Author of Amatora, How Japan Saved American Style, and Status and Culture, How Our Desire for Social Rank Creates Taste, Identity, Art, Fashion, and Constant Change. W, David Marks. W, David Marks, how the hell are you? Hey, thanks for having me. <laughs> I didn't I'm good. Okay. Oh, this is you're, gonna not gonna, you're not going to talk with me in Japanese? You know, I mean, when, when in America. Okay. I, I, I finally get a chance English, to personally. speak some English, yeah. Do you, like, get <laughs> rusty with English? <laughs> not anymore. There was a point probably where I did because I was more immersed. What's the longest streak you've gone not speaking English? I mean, never more than a day. I think the internet, like, when I would go to Japan before the internet really took off, mm. I felt a little more isolated. Okay. But, you know. Now I you come back and you're like, what does Riz mean? <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I, like, I know more of that than I think I should. But then once in a <laughs> while, there's probably this, like, there's this, I'm always fascinated with where it comes from, but there's, like, this uh, black hole of things I don't know. And it's always, like, Larry the Cable Guy. Oh. <laughs> Your cultural blind spot are the uh, blue-collar kings of comedy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, comedy so tour, it's like, you know, it's okay. like Larry the Cable Guy. Like, yeah. Uh, what? Yeah. What yeah. is this Larry the Cable guy? Your mom uh, be a redneck if... <laughs> and then I try to like over, yeah. overcompensate. Uh, but yeah, Get I never know what is. Well, thank you for flying all the way here from yeah. Tokyo, Japan. Just, um, just to come us. on the only podcast yeah. that matters. That was that was super tight of you, dude. We yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, flying out tonight. <laughs> yeah, one day, for real. One day this only. Is your, wait, so you're, you're going to leave here all amped up and just hop on a 14-hour flight? Yeah, 14 is nothing to me anymore. In and out, yeah. SEAL team fits, baby. That's the yeah. way we like to do it here. Yeah. Yeah, you got to come when it's fresh. So, so we're going to call you David. That's cool. That's that's what my name is. So it David, works. great yep. to see you. The first thing we want to do. Well, actually, do you want to tell the people what the W stands for? The we W stands for William. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was given to me in honor of my grandfather, but he was Billy. Okay. And my parents did not want me to be Billy. Why not? Because it's Billy. <laughs> and so, you know, now like Williams are Will... Willie, maybe Willie, but like it, back Willie. in the day, it was Billy. So I was going to be Billy, and so they just they gave me William and they called me David. And then I got to college, and like my my email was assigned W Marks, and nobody knew who it was. <laughs> and there was another David Marks, and so that guy oh, got man. all my emails. Confusing. So I I did W David Marks just as a kind of like way to differentiate myself. Gotcha. And then as an author, it also is helpful because there's like. 10 other David Marks is doing stuff yeah, in the world. There's right. Ron Marks that I think was a pretty popular author. Yeah, I think yes. he might have got mentioned in the yeah. intro. Capital yes. I think his uh, yes. titles were a bit shorter, though, a bit more concise. Yeah. I think yeah. his editor was like, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe cut kill out a couple the of subtitle. Words, bro. <laughs> yeah, he sold a lot better than I did. Too. Oh, yeah? yeah. Well, from a commercial standpoint. Not after this pod. Yeah, okay. he never came on throwing fits, which always starts off with a. Did you fit even check. invite him? <laughs> you know what? He's a little busy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Billy, let's get right into a fit check, bro. Okay, yes, sir. Why don't you tell us everything that you wore today to the pod? Um, so this shirt is a brand called Kalum, mm -hmm. which is designed by the stylist Akio Hasegawa, who mm -hmm. is the guy, if you know, you know, but uh, he is the stylist who used to be a Popeye, and he mm -hmm. invented oh, the shit. big fit. Wow. And so there's a, you know, there was a Times Magazine story about big fit starting in 2020. No, it's 2016 <laughs> with Popeye. Uh, Akio Hasegawa, and he had been the creative director for Nautica as well recently. Mm. And then, so he moved over and has his own brands called Kloom, and this is where the Sick. shirt's from. Uh, and then my, I've got under this a white undershirt from Yonatomi, which is a, a Japanese knitwear company from Yamagata. I hope everyone's writing this down. Yeah, this, say, is, all take like, this is all people. new. This new. whole podcast, by the way, is just going to be full of, if you know, you know, Japanese darts. Yeah. Yes, I'm... Is, it's a reference for later. For you're you, gonna, just, for you, just regular. You don't want to listen to this like, at, at 0.5 speed. Yeah, exactly. So you got time to transcribe. So the undershirt once again. Sorry, uh, Yonetomi. Yone okay. Tomi. Uh, and the pants are from a Japanese brand called Tsuki T U K I out of Okayama, who do a lot of. This is like a baker pant, so it's like they do a lot of military repro, but okay. the, that's not like strict repro. It's just. They they take the idea they and riff. they they riff on it they and really great twill yeah. great materials. Uh, I think these socks are Fruit of the Loom. 
Okay. Japanese Undershirts, Hanes. No, yeah, just I get it at Target. When I go home, I get, my, I get I go to Target. And then <laughs> the first uh, stop. You don't yeah. fuck with Uniqlo socks? Yeah. Muji? They don't fit. So I wear size 13 shoes. Nice. And okay. They do not make socks for Congrats people. Congrats on your with. penis, Billy. Do they make, uh, <laughs> I mean, shopping in Japan must be tough. As How tall are you? 6'4". You should have been a hooper. Yeah. Um, but that's like point guard size in the NBA. I, yeah. But like, is it is it hard finding so- clothing that fits you in Japan? Uh, it, well, when like, the Tom Brown the size, but it just fits, fits yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, it's, no. So when, when, uh, Tom Brown, super fit stuff was in yeah. slim fit, then everything was like, Oh, it was a little sucked. too small, but yeah. Hey, it works because pants are, supposed those are to be shorts. Too small. On, those pants yeah. are literally shorts on you. Dude. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, when everything in big fit, it's like, great. Now yeah. it's, uh, <laughs> it actually fits. So I, I, I can't buy shoes. That's the one thing. Okay. So when I come home to the U S I get shoes. So what are the shoes? These are, these are New Balance. What are these? You tell me. They're like... What's the number? I can't see. 574s? Yeah, 574s. Yeah, there you go. Classic. Uh, I need, you know, with age, I like walking, but you get a plantar fasciitis. Is that what it's called? Yeah, I, I think so. I have foot pain, and so I got to wear a sneaker. got to go to Dr. Stretch. I do need... Oh, yeah. That, Did balance, he, yeah. That, guy, that guy rules. Did he buy any sneakers on this trip? Not on this trip. No. Okay. Uh, what are the panties? Yeah. Uh, Brooks Brothers. Oh, whoa. Oxford. Huh? Traditional fit. Like the old man boxers. Yes. Wow. You're on the list, bro. Here we go. What's, so James uh, keeps a running list of all the boxer wearers as a boxer wearer himself. Okay. Yep. But these are is, like the, bo- is, these it, are the high rise yeah. old man, mm-hmm. like the same Oxford class uh, uh, as the shirts. It is White a and blue. List. Beautiful. Honestly, uh, I would love w like those David as like jammies. Marks. I don't know if those, those would be my daily drivers personally, right. but uh, yeah. Okay. Wow, You're on the list. list. Wow, dude, this yeah. list right. has been John growing. Teats and Ben Solomon. Wow. And Ace Rothstein in Casino. <laughs> there's, yeah. there's also fictional characters. Yeah. On okay, the great, list. great. Tony great. Soprano, Reynolds Woodcock, mm-hmm. um, and you're sipping on some just simple still water. Yeah. That's what do people choose guy. normally? Whatever usually they like want. Seltzers usually like, uh, yeah. or like maybe like an energy drink if they're you know running around all day. I but I feel like if it's got effervescence then you're burping during the mm, podcast yes it's not, that might not be a, a personal you? problem okay yeah, that's a personal no. problem for me so yeah, yeah. Okay. i All try right, to well. keep it i was fired from my own books on tape <laughs> really you know i know i noticed this because <laughs> I, looked, I looked up um i wanted to read some one-star reviews off amazon but <laughs> yeah i didn't really have any oh damn and okay. the book was narrated by someone else yeah they got someone they're like we want someone who's even nerdier than you to wow narrate this <laughs> Um, and but less, no, less I did, mm-hmm. I was supposed to do, uh, like 63 pages a day. It was like the super tight wow. schedule. And I showed up in the first day we did like five because I'd be like, so, uh, the sociologist stop. <laughs> Sorry. Do it again. Uh, the social stop. <laughs> It's sociologist, not sociologist, oh, or something. Wow. Like, they were so writing me, and so we did four pages, and then it was Plantor over a weekend. Fasciitis. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and the so, language is a living document. And I got there on Monday. I got basically they woke up on Monday. They're like, "You're fired." <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're just were gonna you hire relieved? somebody. Low key. Yeah, it was really hard, and Sounds it was like, like it. it was the middle of the summer, and I was in this little booth uh, that had no air conditioning because of the oh. sound, mm-hmm. and so you would just go in and try to do thirty minutes before you like you know yeah. roll so out. So reading W. David Marks confirmed hard. Sorry, it is hard to read your book. Is what you're what yes, you're and there's also there's this famous <laughs> cliche with books on tape where you start it and you're like, who wrote this shit? <laughs> and and appar- and apparently like I have a world record for like sentence three. I was like, really? Yeah, it's it just. <laughs> It just wasn't, it's like, I don't write to talk, you know, it's like, yeah. it's right, right, right. So anyway, you write to uh, write. Exactly. A writer's so, writer. Uh-huh. Anyway, but the point is I could never do seltzer one. Yeah. Getting well, fired into the mic. I hope everyone caught that. Um, yeah, let's get into the meat and potatoes of the only yeah. podcast matter. Speaking of writing your books, you literally wrote the book on this topic with Amit Tora. Yep. But in a nutshell, can you just tell us why do the Japanese do American menswear better than Americans? So it's two things. It's first of all the Japan, and it, you know, it's it, you don't want to just say like Japan is like the entire country, but there's a bunch of people with a craftsman, craftsperson mindset, yes, who have done everything better. So like, <laughs> if you want Neapolitan pizza, it's great. If you want the craft beer now, is great. Whiskey, whatever. So there's you there's a whole pattern of imported things that people bring a uh, craftsperson mindset to. Then the second is just the particular historical quirk that in the 60s, this one businessman was like, I got to sell clothes to young people. I can't find a style that doesn't make them look like juvenile delinquents. Mm-hmm. And then he finds Ivy League style. 
And he's like, that's, that's it. And then that's basically the birth of Japanese menswear. And so it just happens to be this American traditional stuff where it all started. And then that spun out uh, and brought us to today. So it's, it, but it, I mean, the craftsperson mindset is. Craftsperson mindset versus like the more capitalist mindset, yeah. which is like squeezing every, cutting every corner, squeezing totally. every cent out of every step of the process. Yeah. Um, t- sucking the soul out for the sake of the bottom line. Exactly. And America, baby. And the thing, uh, God bless her. I like, I hate explanations of culture that are like in 1734, uh, this, you know, famous prince did this, but who the fuck wrote this shit? Yeah, (laughs) exactly. There is though this thing in medieval Japan where there was a hierarchy that was like, you know, God ordained hierarchy where it was aristocrats, samurai, farmers, craftspeople, merchants. And the most important thing kind of in Japanese culture is that being a craftsperson is higher than being a merchant. Mm. So if you make stuff, you want to position yourself as a craftsperson, not as a merchant. So you want to not look like you're cutting corners. You want to look like, oh, I don't even care about making money from this. I'm just trying to make the best thing possible. Is is there a Japanese term for this commitment to excellence mindset? There's... so grind. uh, (laughs) Monotsukuri is this word that means making things. It just literally means making things, but it's become kind of glorified to mean this... The the mindset of really caring about the thing you make. But... I mean, honestly, like... Being in a store and just seeing someone like when they wrap a shirt for you, like the way they just fold the wrapping paper and and, and place it in the bag, I'm like, that was inspiring. Right. That makes you want right. to go home and write the best fucking dumb email I'm ever going to write. <laughs> um, you know, asking for whatever, like some free, free sneakers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, it's crazy. But do you have? I have one. And yeah, I can give my example if uh, it helps jog your, jog your you know gets the wheels turning. But do you have a favorite example of how everything in Japan is simply better than everything in America? The subway, mm. the, the trains, public transportation, public transportation. One. I mean, uh, I was quite surprised because Google Maps would say something like, "Oh, get the um, two forty from Fifty First Street or whatever," and it actually did come on time. Like mm. there are times, and New York's gotten better about that, but in Japan, it's like someone will you get fired if yeah. someone will quit if right. the train's like one minute late. But so everything is super pre- precise. Everything's clean. You would, if there was like a really nice cookie that fell on a seat, you would eat the cookie. I wouldn't say that about <laughs> So in US. Japan, the five second rule is actually like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it's, an yeah, it's like 50 seconds. <laughs> also, everyone uh, gets out of the way and lets people exit the train before stepping on. Yes. Steps in the middle of the car. Yes. My favorite example is um, immediately when you get, when you land at Narita or Haneda or whatever airport, uh, at the baggage carousel, there's a line like two feet actually away from like the carousel itself. And people stand behind that line. And there's the line exists also on the subway. Um, so, you know, keep your feet like behind this line so people have room to like stand. But by standing behind the line, everyone can now, when their bag arrives, step up and take their bag versus you get back to New York. Everyone's like, yo, get the fuck out of my way, bro. Yeah. My fucking shit coming first. Some kid is riding it, you know, some <laughs> yeah. fucking bullshit. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, I've been on a train, a subway train in New York where someone breaks into the announcer's booth and does fake announcements. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. That's, that's awesome. That's never happened to me in Japan. Once. That's awesome. Though. Uh, I've had a Gatorade poured on my head uh, in the you mentioned that, Street, yeah. Essex Street what color? station. I, maybe orange. Oh. That's never happened to me in Japan. I've had... Uh, <laughs> I was on the JMZ platform in Williamsburg and someone in one of the high rises nearby was uh, slingshotting eggs at all of us on the platform. That's never happened in Japan. (laughs) Yeah. So, you know, I love New York though. Yeah. God bless her. Let's go back to Menzra though. What's like the, what are some of the biggest differences that stand out to you between like the culture surrounding American menswear and the culture surrounding Japanese menswear? Yeah. I mean, one of the things is there used to be no culture of American menswear, hmm. right? I mean, that's new. You, you're kind the of. first generation, right? Well, um, pretty much, yeah. And when I was, so I worked down the street, you know, 2001 to 2003, and there was streetwear, mm-hmm. and streetwear right. was still really niche. Like, this was pre Pharrell and Kanye right. and all that. So it's like a life era. Yeah. So like a life revenue club was a big deal. The map that you put on Twitter. Yeah. Basically. Exactly. Yeah. That was yeah. it. You know, and you would go to Supreme and you'd walk into Supreme and yeah. then they wouldn't help you. They but would treat you like shit. Yeah. <laughs> but they would, there was no bouncer at Supreme. Like, dump you, a you just, in her head. Yeah. <laughs> probably, it was probably those guys. Uh, peep, I don't know if I've revealed this on a podcast before, but I was, uh, there was a point when I was in New York and it was probably 2003 where I was 
uh, was extorted is maybe the right word, but uh, like the Supreme <laughs> staff pushed me into a corner and got 20 bucks out of me. Really? Like, yeah. What, they like stuff you in a you locker? Got bullied? Yeah, basically. They, like I, I opened the door and the guy kind of spilled his drink and I don't remember if I really, if he really did, but he's like, hey, you got to buy me a new drink. And I was like, that was I'm, a $20 Coke. I was like, I'm an intern, man. And I'm like, really? <laughs> Wow. And then they're like, hey, and then like they backed me into a court until I was like, here's your wow. $20. Yo, James sure. Jebby, I know VF Corp. Send it VF Corp. And invoice. Yeah, it's, it's cool. It's Gator all, all water under the bridge. getting stuffed into a box logo locker. Yes. <laughs> the uh, David Mark story. And now if they did it to me now, I'd just pay up earlier and not go through the humiliation. Yeah, sure. But uh, the point was there was no men's wear. And then the, in Japan, it's like right. the first time I went, it was like, why is everyone dressed so well? <laughs> and what was interesting is my, my thought was, well, America will never have this mm. because clothing is too, I don't know if it's gay coded or right. women coded or whatever, but it's like guy, like heterosexual guys can't be into clothing. That was like some Not wrong, iron God. rule. Yeah. And, uh, it's been, it was just fascinating, like 2007 and eight to see the rise of fashion blogs. It's like, Oh, this is all coming to the U S. So, Japan was just in it longer. Yeah. And uh, and now it's like all a melange where you can't really tell. But how online are Japanese menswear, you know, enthusiasts or the John, the Japanese John's enthusiasts? Like, are they like obsessed with fit pics and Instagram and like, like some of them kind of are yeah. some of them. But like, it's it's just nicer. <laughs> It's like less it's competitive. Better, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, I don't well, I don't know if it's, it's just less aggro. It's yeah. more like, I don't know. This is nice. What do you think? It feels less online. It, does, it does. I mean, the, the main thing is the bulk of it is still physical and retail based yes. and not e-commerce based. And, right. uh, so it, it's different. And the, I mean, the other thing too, is that what made American style cool was that it was a bunch of people who weren't into clothing who wore cool clothing. Like you think about Ivy League style in the '60s, right. the whole point where they weren't like, "Oh, where'd you get that uh, button down from?" <laughs> yeah, oh right. yeah, ID, I know. ID. You know, so right. it, my dad. It was just like a bunch of people. Like I don't know. You go to the campus shop and you just yeah. this is all they have. Right. And uh, Japan was very much more like uh, it was intentional, right? And the U.S. has now become more intentional where it's like you go to menswear parties and people are like, let's talk about menswear. And right. the whole point used Ugh. to be you dress up <laughs> yeah. in order to go to a thing uh, or you dress up to express yourself. You don't dress up because you're part of a subculture so are, dressing are we up. now here more intentional than our Japanese counterparts? If you had to kind of like, not to make it a competition. Uh, but. I think like there's not, there's not that many menswear guys who are young. There's like a lot of young guys who just dress well, mm. but I think there's actually not as many. So just actually cool. people who are like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. like I have a I have a tumbler and yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, like right. that kind of stuff doesn't exist as much. Is it acquisition based as much over there as it is here, where it's like he who has the most stuff wins? What he does. Well, there's I think there's like a normal person isn't there, but then there's the the mega collectors. Mm. Sure. Yeah. Like I went to someone's uh, place the other day and they had like. I don't know, a thousand pairs of Nikes. Sick. And in their home, in their tiny little, and like, in their, it was in their, this warehouse. Literally? Like okay. their, their fa his father was like a, some sort of wholesaler and they just had this empty warehouse and now it's full of shoes. And, and okay. Things. What's that? So it's a photo essay series of, of Japanese collectors of like their favorite brands. Right. right yeah. The I forget. Fanatics or something. Yeah. It's like a, but it's all like this person collects comb, this person, this right. someone with like all these horse bit, like Gucci horse bits. And right. Yeah. And then like, you know, Nigo's got, Sure. Everything. Right. And his he's house got, is a museum. He has, <laughs> and he has all sorts of stuff where you didn't even know it existed. Because I thought like, oh, he's going to just have 501s or whatever. And it's like, oh, no, I have all these categories of clothes that no one's seen in the 50 years. The first pair of jeans. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's like really into peanut sweaters. And so he has all the peanut sweaters. Oh, like okay. Snoopy yeah, and like Snoopy. Charlie Brown. Uh, that's his current yeah, obsession. All these Jack... No, that's a that's long, a long hell of yeah. obsession. Or he has all these um, like... Butterfinger salesman from the 1930s <laughs> jackets or something. Like that. I didn't, didn't know that was a thing. So I think the like mega collectors just beat out everybody. Yeah. Uh, and then, but then like the normal person isn't quite there anymore. And just like, I don't know, just wears. But, but more those collectors stuff. too, it's coming from such a, a pure, a pure, honest, sincere place of enthusiasm, not about like flexing. Yeah. Like kind of what, yeah. you know, we have like, over here. To also, not to, not to go into the oldies, but fuck yeah, menswear had hmm. such an aggressive edge to it that you would never. <laughs> Never see in Japan, Agro. right? Yeah. Like you wouldn't see someone shitting on Alan Edmonds. 
Yeah, my bad. <laughs> but, so again, but, so but when I saw that, I was like, this is the funniest thing I've ever seen. Like, I can't believe somebody understands this so well to have, uh, yeah. whatever, to have these few Whatever views. genius, like, co-wrote that book. Yeah. I think he just needed it was, to get it's laid. It's still anonymous, I'm I think pretty he just sure. Right? to get laid, to be honest. Great yeah. It's Kevin Burroughs and someone else. <laughs> great, okay. pic, great picture book. Um, <laughs> Are have you had menswear Sheba on yet, or her, the menswear dog? Have no, you had menswear dog no. on? I remember that guy. Because that guy, yeah. he outsells every other menswear <laughs> author. Really? Uh, Urban sure. Outfitters number one bestseller. <laughs> Are you jealous of a dog, David? Uh, <laughs> yeah, it'd, it'd be nice to have you know, yeah, bigger audience. Those Shibu sales. Um, you mentioned how a lot of the culture and scene is rooted in the physical and the retail. Yep. And that's like immediately obvious when you go there. It's not about you know just Instagram, Instagram, Instagram. What are, in your opinion, the best stores in Tokyo? I mean, it's really hard because the the scope and the scale of Japanese retail is just like 10x everywhere yeah. else, right? I mean, New York's caught up. I mean, New York's got a lot more, but... Uh, we are doing okay. You know, like... We're so back. Uh, Gian De Leon was in Tokyo... I don't know, six months ago or something. Yeah. We went to Koenji, which is like the vintage store district. And you think it's the vintage store di- district. So it's got like, I don't know, 20 or 30 shops. It must have like a hundred. And by like store number 40, you're just like, I can't do, <laughs> I, know. I can't do anymore. And they had one that Not was like. Not another M65, please. <laughs> but you know, but there's like one that was only a uh, vintage Brooks Brothers, vintage polo, vintage J press. So they specialized. Or they all specialize. And, uh, and he really wanted to find this place called Chill Weeb, which is, <laughs> it Fire. only sells vintage anime shirts. Like, this is a hot store right now. And they're like $1,500 uh, Acura shirts or something. Um, <laughs> the craziest store in Tokyo and maybe the world, the menswear store, it's called Softs, S O F T S. Uh, it's in Kichijoji. It's on the, the roof of this building. And it's like he only sells menswear that you've never seen anywhere else and it it's all ridiculous it's like is uh, it vintage some of it's vintage and some of it's like his own weird collaborations with swiss military beret companies (laughs) yeah and like uh like if 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 you want a normal beret don't go there if you want a giant size beret uh they have (laughs) your big ass head if you want a hat that says made in china on it that was made in the usa that's the place to go to okay uh so he that store is is crazy and great but then i mean where i shop is like beams plus beams plus is just so reliable and and great and is that your go-to beams and because there's a thousand of them yeah beams plus beams plus does the traditional stuff and you're not beams boy boy beams boys (laughs) for girls beams boys for girls yeah what so beams boy is like the (laughs) trad line for women it's like the beams plus for girls okay okay i've been buying my my, my clothes at the girl's (laughs) shop yeah (laughs) They're like, why the fuck is this guy doing here again? So Beams is like your, I don't know, just kind of middle of the road. But is that like, because Beams, you know, here it's like, oh shit, Beams, go to whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But Beams is it sure. more kind of mainstream, middle of the road? It's uh, not mainstream. There? It's just reliable. And okay. they have a lot of basics like right. button downs that are always the same every year and great. But if you also want to get weird and freaky and go to a store that specializes in gigantic berets, boy, do I have a place yeah, for you. Yeah, softs. So, <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a range. Softs and gets the, me hard. The vintage is also, like, there's there's probably four or five stores in my own neighborhood that I don't know the names of. Really? But have the most amazing collection of early 1990s Ralph Oxfords in, like, really crazy colors uh, and they have an infinite supply of them. If, wow. if you can't find them in the United States because they're all on they're my all street. Yeah. But like, <laughs> I don't even neighbor. know what the names of these stores are because there's just so many of them and they're all they're all probably owned by the same company. Yeah. Have you gotten numb to like living in a menswear clothing shopping paradise or do you still are you still like blown away every single time you walk into a, like a, a store like Softs? You just have to have more discipline because I, I, I have this uh, long-standing emotional complex, which is I hate buying things I don't use. Right. Okay. It makes me feel bad. So like if I see a shirt and I'm like, I got to get that, I start feeling bad for the other shirts that are going to get pushed. <laughs> I totally know how you feel. Yeah. <sighs> Clothes have feelings too. Yeah. yeah. And like, I, I don't They're know. They're sentient beings. And so, so that I think that tempers a little bit. Okay. Like, Ooh. And then, uh, so you're it. emotional yet efficient. Yes. Your heart and head. That's what I try to do. And then also Wait, just is like, it, is it Shintoism? Did you feel this way before you moved to Japan? Uh, I felt this, I felt this way before I okay. moved to Japan. All, all I, I and I don't believe that there are spirits in all my okay. clothing. I just, <laughs> just feelings. I just feel like, uh, it's, it's a waste to buy a shirt that just sits in the And closet. you're not wrong. 
and, and, and the other problem is that, okay, so all, almost all my shirts are buttoned down Oxford cloth shirts. And, I, and then I'm like, okay, I got white, I got blue, I got pink, I got the Oxford stripes. Oh, I want the Oxford stripe in pink, and now I need <laughs> uh, this with a club collar or whatever. So you start fleshing it out, and then you're like, oh, I need this in orange stripe. Right. And then you get it in orange stripe, and you're like, when the fuck am I going to wear this? Yeah, it doesn't match like a anything. fucking clown. Yeah, well, and so, unless it's a throwing fit. No, shirt. but I was thinking of a club collar okay. Oxford version, not what we <laughs> just sold out. Thank you again yes. to everybody who bought the peach. Uh, <laughs> and so the, so then you're so, it's like, is this just to collect and to open my closet and be like, hey, yeah. it's, it's like Skittles or <laughs> is it is it instead to actually wear? And what you realize is like, I, don't, I wear white and blue probably four out of seven days. So why am I going out to buy like, I'm going to get this purple that I'm never going to put on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but you know, New Year's, New Year's Eve comes but <laughs> once a year. <laughs> Has moving to Japan, like how long have you been in Japan full time? 21 years. Whew. But your style was kind of rooted in like growing up in the South, growing up in like an academic context and like sure. being into like traditional American sportswear and Ivy. Is that fair to say? Yeah. Well, it's complicated because as a kid, I was wearing that stuff and hated it. <laughs> okay. And so, you know, there's all these photos that I'm able to pull out now and be like, look at me in a tweed blazer right. and, and Sabago camp, campsites and like... Uh, and, you know, I'm interviewed for Japanese magazines and I can show these and be like, look how authentic I am. Yeah. Right? Uh, but at the same time, at 14, I like just wanted to be cool with the grunge kids. Right. Mm. And they're like, go away. Yeah. Like, yeah. Nice. Nice. Try khaki. Yeah, it's like, college yeah. boy. He's yeah. like, no, but I've got Joe this, college over here. I don't know. I have this dinosaur junior <laughs> tape. Yeah. We could be friends. And so, you know, I was wearing, trying to wear band t-shirts with, mm. and, you know, I don't think I started wearing jeans until I was about 18. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> And this man didn't feel <laughs> denim on his thighs till 18. Because the other thing is like denim, I had, I was really skinny and the, all the denim that I inherited from my brother was like skin tight because it was like 80s uh, denim. And so until like a wide fit came out, I just like didn't feel comfortable in jeans. So I, I <laughs> wore... Silver tabs changed silver your tabs life. Silver saved your life. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> exactly. So then I when I went to Japan, I just never thought about clothing or fashion. And then in Japan, I was like, oh, you could wear... Uh, a bathing ape t-shirt and some like selvage denim and some Adidas superstars. And now I'm, Hey, it's fashion right. with a capital F. So that got me into streetwear and I was wearing streetwear and then the streetwear kind of merged into maybe APC. Mm-hmm. And Apece. then the, that kind of, when Tom Brown came out, I was like, Oh, I know all that. I grew up on all that. Right. And then I, that like became a, Trojan horse for me to get back. All the into reference the points were already stuff. there when you yeah. were yelling at your mom for dressing you up like a nerd. Yeah, and yeah. then also like all the fits from the '90s were so big that it they actually started fitting. Hmm, right. Uh, by the time <laughs> I picked them back up in like 2008. So but moving to Japan did kind of like blow your mind wide open to the possibilities oh, yeah, yeah. of because where were you gonna inf- get it? In- infinity. Yeah. yeah. And you know, uh, like on college campuses, that we dress us up. Like I'm sure college kids now dress much better than they did mm-hmm. when I was there. Think but, so? But they're probably in fucking do. Zara, dude. Yeah, but it's like they're. I don't know. Young people, I feel like try a little bit harder, or they at least Maybe. know. Well, the the cameras on them twenty four seven. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Versus like when we were in college, where that wasn't the case. Yeah. yeah. Um, so anyway, in America, there was like no. I mean, I, I I talk about this a lot, but I watched a lot of MTV. I'm from Pensacola, Florida. Like there's there's no local exposure to culture so i'm watching mtv all the time and you know i want almost everything on mtv and then house of style would come on with cindy crawford i'd be like click like this is (laughs) i don't i don't care about this runway collection i'm I'm learning yeah (laughs) so i i did not watch i just thought fashion was like not related to me right um you've mentioned i mean the latest one you just mentioned bathing ape Ape. you mentioned i don't know just a bunch of legendary japanese brands I'm going to put you on the spot right now yeah. and maybe should have given you this in, uh, question ahead of time. Yeah. What are your favorite Japanese brands of all time? Of all time. Yeah. Let's mount, let's um, mount Rushmore. It. So top your, the, the best four unranked. Well, okay. So the thing about Mount Rushmore is these are presidents who were not living at the same time. So I think we can go yeah. by era too, right? Oh, okay. sure. So, or you can blow wide open. Just, just name yeah. them. Uh, it's almost so like, like this you got to put Van Jacket on there. So whether okay, Van sure. Jacket today uh-huh. is good or not, Van Jacket was the first menswear what brand. It He's the George Washington. Yeah. And the most influential. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So you got to put Van Jacket on there. That was 50s. Um, 40s? 60s, 60s. Okay. 60s. I think it, I mean, it technically started in 48, but it's 60s. Ooh, uh, maybe put beams on there okay. just for the West Coast side of it and everything they've done for denim. Uh, <laughs> this is getting hard. Um, 
You don't have to keep it to four. Yeah, what's your favorite Japanese I mean, like brand? Bathing Ape, again, it's like, you know, the thing about fashion is that not every brand can last for be cool forever, right? And right. I mean, yeah. Come to Garcon Gar is incredible that mm -hmm. it's been cool forever. Or like, Yoji, right? Yeah, you know, and, but Yoji went, had a bankruptcy period, right? And that doesn't so, mean it wasn't cool. Yeah, well, it kind of dipped. There was like a dip, but like Come to Garcon, like Ray Kamakuba just became a god, and then right. like, it's been, this, it's been <laughs> that way since. Um but Bathing Ape, like, at the time, that no one had seen anything like that. And so Hiroshi Fujiwara, who was Nigo's mentor, like, he dipped in. He had good enough, but he wasn't... He sees himself, like, as a musician, not as, like, a mentor guy. So, You're talking but, about, like, fragment designs? Like yeah, his, fragments later. And yeah, he had... Burton. Um, <laughs> sorry? He was at Burton. And he, he does stuff with Burton. Yeah. and He's had a, two dozen brands. Yeah. Can't even name them all. But Bathing Ape was the, the one where it's like, I mean, he was this HTM is, too. This is uh, taking the Stussy model and blowing it out. Right. So that one's hard to ignore. Uh, yeah, I guess Yoji and Kamen Garçon for the 80s. Uh, Do you have a favorite Japanese denim I brand? I wear, so Tsuki, the people who made the pants I'm wearing now, they do denim and I wear that a okay. bunch. I mean, APC is interesting because I wore APC denim all the time and that's Kaihara denim. So they were one of the first brands globally to, to make a big deal out of we're using to Japanese use that denim. Mill. Yeah. Right, right, right. Okay. So, you know, and what is, what is that, truly Japanese? And then he posted that racist meme about cherry blossoms. Yes, uh, he did. Oh, I don't know. Sorry, am I? It was pre cancel culture, so he skated. But, okay, uh, he definitely. Offended am I canceled now because no, I wore? He is no. Okay, Jean -tu -tu. Jean -tu -tu. So yeah, I don't know. I mean, there's there's lots of denim, like you know, Orslo is a brand I've never worn, but every time I see their stuff, I'm like, this is great. Yeah. yeah. So uh, that's the other thing. Like I was in. Uh, London, I did an event with Jason Jules who did Black Ivy, mm -hmm. and we were walking around the Clutch Cafe uh, store, which is, is pretty cool in London, and there was like a beautiful sweater, and I was like, that's such a great sweater, and he's like, but it's a sign of maturity when you can look at a sweater and say, that's a great sweater, but I don't have to have this. Right. Yeah. And so it's like, not for me. Yeah. What was and the brand like a, of the sweater? I forget it was. It was just <laughs> really bright and, okay. and like yellow, and it was beautiful, but I don't need to wear it. And so I think it's the same with like a lot of Japanese denim brands. Like, that's great, but I don't need to own this. Yeah. I don't need so, the fucking samurai I don't need jeans. More yeah, I need John and I'm trying to think. Yeah. So, did we miss anyone? I don't know. It's a hard. I mean, by constraining it to four, <laughs> I feel like that's tough. But, but I think it's like, I think that you saying Mount Rushmore, sorry, that's, yeah. that is chiseled in stone. Yes, you sir. Know? And so that's, I think that. Stolen stone. That made me a little. But also, hesitant. I think you went most influential. I want to know what your favorite. My favorite. Yeah, I mean, are. I'll tell you, I mean, it's what I wear. So it's yeah. like Beams Plus for the casual stuff. Comicer shirts does all my dress shirts. Best in the business, baby. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, they, they do made to measure. Kamakura? Yeah. Yeah, bro. I'm the number one shopper of the Vintage Ivy collection. Yeah. 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 Vintage Ivy is great. And they've been doing great stuff recently, but also just I have long arms and they do made to measure. So. Oh, there you go. That's important. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Tuki, I just said, for the pants. Um you like what you like. Oh, there's a great brand, Psy, S-C-Y-E, that is basics. Okay. They're kind of, um, there's like that zone of brands. And then I, I didn't talk about the, the zone of interest. It got too hot, so I couldn't wear it. But I was wearing this uh, sweatshirt rugby hybrid that's from a brand called Adult Oriented Robes. <laughs> wow. Um, Yo, great Japanese brand name. And so, he, <laughs> like, you know, AOR Music. So he's obsessed with AOR Music, which is Adult Oriented Record. That's the record label. Uh, and so he does, he's like on the city pop stuff. So he has okay. a brand that it's like representing 80 city pop. Uh, it's like kind of athleisure. And that's, nah, this I don't, is I don't know how to such a it. specific reference. I yeah. love it. Which is and so Japanese I've been buying way. a bunch of stuff from AR recently. It's like real big fit. It's great. Yeah. Um, and that's great. <laughs> so I don't know. There's just like this middle zone of brands that aren't super big. It's just great. Everyone makes great stuff. It's hard to... Hard to whittle it down. I mean, I mean with VizVim, it's like, I don't wear ooh. VizVim, but it's hard not to say VizVim's not incredible what they do. Is Viz a Japanese brand? How is not? Is Roki in, is he in Japan or is he in America? He's mostly, I think he's kind of split time, but okay. he is, he grew up in Japan. Is Engineered Garments a Japanese brand? Ooh, ooh that one's harder. Damn. The, Nepenthe's Japanese. Yes. I mean, I think engineering Engineered Garments makes a very big deal out of being made in the USA. I agree. I didn't mention them at being all, but I, York. he's got great stuff that I wear. Hard to beat. Okay. Yeah. Are there any, you mentioned 
A O R adult oriented <laughs> robes. You mentioned yep. Sai. Yeah. Are there any other kind of like bubbling Japanese brands that are doing really exciting things that you know everyone here knows Capital. Yep. Mm-hmm. Everyone here knows Viz. Um, you know the the go to go to Japanese brands, but like who are some brands that people should really start paying attention to? There's a brand called Inoi the in- Inoy Professional E N N O Y. I don't know what that means. Okay. Um, it's by the stylist. That one is pretty hot right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> AOR, anything that Akio Hasegawa does, the stylist that he's related to. Uh, I don't know, but you know, United Arrows and Beams, and they've got. They're just churning they're out just classics. They just always do great stuff. Graph they, paper is graph paper like oh, hot over there? Oh, that's right a now? thing, I think. Yeah. All yeah. the Gorpy kind of stuff, right? Yeah. Um, like, and we didn't talk about like I don't know white mountaineering. Sure. And, I mean th- it's infinite, right? It's hard <laughs> it really to, is. It's hard to. It's awesome. I mean the thing is that when people come, like menswear guys come to Japan, I meet with them. They always have this list that like I don't know any of these things, man. Like they really? like, people know more than I do being there because I get I don't know. I'm also in a groove where I'm like I'm just gonna go to these three places. You know what that is? That's the flatting of status and culture, which we're gonna talk about soon. Let's do it. Um, but before we get there, so like. I think something something that is pretty clear is that um, there are American subcultures that it, within Japan, the subculture becomes obsessed with it, whether it's like the rockabillies. Yeah. I just saw there's a Jamaica day in Japan sure. where people are fucking <laughs> popping their asses and yep. daggering. <laughs> what are some American subcultures that young Japanese people right now are currently obsessed with? Uh, those are all really specific and out of control and there's not that many people into it. Right. The rockabilly thing was was I wouldn't say mainstream, but that subculture was huge in the eighties. And now there's like one of those old um rockabilly dance groups that still is out there like once a month in Harajuku and they're like literally 65. Yeah. Damn, good the for Mo- them. Yeah. The Mohawks like all the, or the fucking bouffons all yeah. the way up. Yeah. But it's like, it's just them. So it's like saying young people into that as a misnomer. And there's the people who ha- are into the like low rider Chicano yeah. culture. Oh, the cellos, yeah. 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 And but I think they're in Osaka or something and that's also a small scene. So I think, I mean, most Japanese young people are pretty like norm core and they're not. Yeah, right. They're more into K-pop. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, seriously, like, I, I think, like, one of the major changes in Tokyo was that there's a neighborhood called, neighborhood called Shin Okubo that's next to Shinjuku that was the Korean ethnic neighborhood. Mm-hmm. And when I first was going to Tokyo, people would speak of it in this really kind of racist way of, like, well, you don't yeah. want to go there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now it's, like, the hottest <laughs> oh, neighborhood yeah. in Tokyo because K-pop's so big. So it's, like, more, it's it feels more crowded than Harajuku sometimes of just, like, oh, wow. young Japanese women going to have Korean sweets or eat eat Korean barbecue and shop at Korean cosmetics. It's, it's really interesting. Well, we know that South Korea has kind of become like the dominant, um, soft culture power in a East Asia yeah. with like music, obviously yes. film, cosmetics, cosmetics, <laughs> uh, aesthetics. Does Japan still have the top spot when it comes to fashion and style or is South Korea? Like, are, is it gaining on Japan? <coughs> this sir, is a on? great question. So I think Japan still has the, uh, I mean, it's actually kind of cool. So I think Japan and Korea are in this interesting coexistence moment where Korea kind of has the... Coexist, baby. uh, (laughs) They have the top spot for the kind of casual fashion that you could actually imitate. Like if you're in Southeast Asia and you don't have a lot of money, you can dress like what you see on Instagram from Korean influencers. Okay. Whereas like everything in Japan is like kind of expensive and Mm. you can't rip it off. Like people aren't wearing fake capital or something. Right. Um, and so Japan kind of owns the space for high end craft artisanal artisanal. And then Korea owns the mass pop young fun segment and they're kind of working together. And I've seen now where there's more stuff in Korea that's imitating the Japan stuff. Hmm. And then there's more stuff in Japan that's imitating the, the Korean stuff. So it's a true cultural exchange. It's like, it is, it, it is a uh, night and day compared to how things have been in the past. If you, if right. you know about East Asian history, mm-hmm. uh, the Japanese colonization of Korea was not very popular in Korea. And so, <laughs> you know um, yeah, there wow. is, uh, there, you know, there's some tension there and right now it, it's been diffused and it's a really healthy culture exchange i don't want to be too you know optimistic or naive about it but it seems really positive so has like for example one one more example is popeye magazine did in uh, a soul 
guide issue mm. and it wasn't it was like very respectful and like this is this is soul and it's cool and you should go there and that was the first time i think they'd ever done a korea travel issue is right? that like the ultimate co-sign the popeye travel guide yeah yeah i mean <laughs> like and it wasn't even like oh go backpacking and rough it it's right. like it's like if you're gonna have a good time in uh tokyo you could also have a good time in seoul the same way and these are cool spots so the young people in exchanging fashion and aesthetics, they are the ones bridging the gap. It, that's called diplomacy right there. <laughs> yeah. They're the ones bringing peace. Um, what about like... That's a book. Diplomacy? <laughs> yeah, talk to your agent. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> no, my, you could, that's for you. That's yeah, your you next can, one, you can, uh, you I got, I'm working on something else. <laughs> what, so like, I think what South Korea and, and Seoul is doing, and this is because the fucking Samsung and um, LG, they have like so much money and they're trying yep. to make Seoul a, a cultural destination. Yep. They're literally importing fucking, you know, whether it's Supreme, whether it's like our legacy, they're just like making Seoul a fashion destination. On the flip side, it is so hard to license your brand to like operate in Japan. Like, uh -huh. is that, uh, do, like, do you see anything changing in like the Japanese landscape? Have you been to Seoul before? Seoul? What's that? Have you been to Seoul? No, I've never been. I really want to go. Seoul, it, it's a really cool city and it has, it just has like, a different energy than Tokyo and it's much more youthful. And for some reason, I don't, I don't think youth are more of a part of the Korean population than Japan, but they're just like more out there. And so when you go to Seoul, you just see people on the street having fun. More. It's vibrant. It's very vibrant. And, and it offers kind of the newest global culture stuff. So if you want to go to a great cafe or craft beer place or, uh, cheese steak place or whatever like the hot thing in new york is they'll have in seoul like instantly oh, where, wow, so now japan's slower at getting the Damn, new stuff they got beat at their own oh, game. Shit. yeah and so i think korea actually got faster at being cutting edge than, mm -hmm. than is that Tokyo the government did. money kind of that's funding that maybe oh, like i think James it's also about? just the diaspora in the sense of you know there's a lot of korean americans sure. a lot of koreans come and study in the u.s and go back whereas japan I, like Japanese students don't come to study in the U.S. anymore. There's never been a Japanese American diaspora the same size as the Korean American diaspora. So, I think some of it's just structural like that. Uh, and Korea, I don't know. I mean, the, the I worked in in tech for a while and, and worked on YouTube, and the Korean record labels' use of YouTube was aggressive and Ahead of cutting time. edge and you know yeah. why did Gangnam style happen <laughs> it's because they were in the habit of like put every single video on YouTube put it give it subtitles give it metadata like they were they that's still the number it. one v most viewed video on YouTube ever or is it Despacito now uh, I yeah, I don't know if it still is, but it was the first it, to hit two billion. Right, it, you know, it shut up Simon. He's still he's still doing his thing. Yeah, yeah and and so that viral video of him performing live is yeah incredible. Or I, I saw the one recently where he was at a Dodgers game right after it came out. Do you know that? And they started playing Gangnam Style just to make people dance, and then they like sh they like cut to him, and he was like. Nah, nah. <laughs> and then he got up and did the oh, dance. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and like now that I watch it, it's like, oh, that was totally staged. Yeah. Right. Well, I think Seoul also, or maybe all of Korea also has like the fastest internet in the world that was like oh, yeah, mandated yeah. by the government. But it's just, it was like a super duper pro internet society yeah. in a way that Japan was like, we're, we're cool. We don't need the internet. Right. So, Damn. uh, <laughs> so, and like, so it's it. just gone in two different directions. So I think Tokyo is where you go for the, like digital detox, mm. uh, if you want the really analog experience that doesn't feel cutting edge. And and the places I like to go in Tokyo now are the like places that have been around for 50 years or, you know, old, uh, old <laughs> things. And then, and, and Seoul's really good. The new That's things. the matrix. Seoul yeah. is the matrix. And so, you know, Tokyo used to be known as like the most cutting edge place. And I think Seoul's replaced that. But what's cool, you know, I don't know how, if you know this, but if you fly from Tokyo to Seoul, it's 90 minutes. And wow. It's so, so close. So you can go to these two places and get these two fantastic experiences that are yeah. really different. Tokyo almost has like a retro futuristic feel to it these days where it's like, this was the most cutting edge shit in like 1983. Yeah. Right. <laughs> anything analog. So like if you use a Japanese website everything to has pay like, your taxes, has like knobs and is tactile. Yeah. Anything textile, textile works. So like trying to pay your taxes on the Japanese web <laughs> website, is just impossible. Like it's like, Oh, you need um, Chrome 4.3 for this. It's yeah, like, yeah. I don't, how did you do that? Uh, <laughs> but then if you like go to the train station and you put four tickets in at once and three of them are backwards and some of them are cut in half, like they all come out like pr perfectly like one, right. two, three, four. So anything analog <laughs> is... But well, you got to do taxes on GeoCities. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like that's... And so for a long time, it's like, Japan needs to catch up. Like, this is this is embarrassing now. I'm like, thank God that Japan was behind because mm. we need 
somewhere in the world yeah. to be like yeah. the analog place. Yeah. And that's why everything's great. So yeah. how do you feel then when you come to New York? Where how do you like when, if we think of these two, world <laughs> two ends of two like two ends of this spectrum with like the matrix and this retro futurism, like where's New York in that? It's a shithole country. New York, uh yeah, be huh. nice. I mean the thing <laughs> The buildings are beautiful. <laughs> yeah. I, do you ever look up? Like, just look up. I was I was up on what is it like seventh and fifty first. I just looked up in this this building. The the marble mm. engraved oh, the carving. Oh, not the, not the billionaire's phallus. Yeah. On fifty six or fifty seven. I don't think it was that one. Okay. But it was just there's nothing like that <laughs> right. in Asia, and you're just like wow this. So New York's got that going for it. Cool. Um, buildings. It, it's got some yes. It's got some uh, grit. Sure. Okay. It's, yeah. I like, See, I like, there's I probably like, some other things. You're being, you're being very diplomatic. Yeah. Happy, diplomatic, as James would say. Is there something, uh, kind of going back to like, you know, the cultural exchange between Japan and America? Is there something trend driven or niche happening in Japan that you think will very soon hit uh, the shores over here? Uh, not to dodge the question, but I do <laughs> think the thing I just said about rejecting digital culture. Like, I think that's coming. Like, I do think we hit this peak with... Are you being hopeful when you say this? Yeah. <laughs> no, but like, I think people are getting bored with being on their phones all the time. Yeah. yeah. And there, there's going to be a, a, a different direction. It's going to go that Japanese direction. I would also say, you know, and one of the, the things that's been cool about Amator coming out is I get a lot of great conversation with new brands who read the book and are like, we want to be really craft-driven. Hmm. And so that idea that let's not uh try to sell out and just make things cheaper and care about profit but really make great things like i think that trend's coming i, really? I think you meant something like oh snow cones yes, snow cones are coming. Yes. you just want like the snow list cones? of four snow things cones? yeah it's cool a popcorn I think, I think tactile uh like like knobs that turn and like you know having yeah. like, the, like the old ipod you know kind of like clicking wheel yeah, yeah. type yeah. shit i yeah. think is kind of uh, along with that like digital detox or the analog yeah. of shit when you, when you wrote your book then, Amatora, did you expect it to become this kind of like, I don't want to speak for you here, but maybe this kind of blueprint that newer brands are like looking to or like, or like a playbook? I did not think about that at all. And when I was writing it, so I wrote it kind of 2013, 2014, and I was so worried that when it came out, people were like, oh, Japan brands, that was so like 2013, Damn. like that I missed the wave. And, it, you know, they only became more popular yeah, from that. That wave the reason, not crested yet. The book, the book is almost is doing better now than when it came out. That's awesome. And be, it's because just more people are into Japanese fashion. So I never thought about it as this is a playbook. I was just telling the history. Right, right. And, uh, but that's, I think that's when, what's been cool is just there's so many young people in the West who decided like, I want to make clothes. Right. And it's, it's hard to make clothes. Right. I mean, the thing, yeah. the thing that You're telling is, us, brother. Uh, the reason Japan still has so much, like so many cool brands is because you can make the stuff in Japan right. and it's and increasingly they're using China or they're using Southeast Asia, but you can still do things in Japan. And, you know, I was on the train from Boston to New York last time I was here and you're just passing like burnt out brick warehouse after yeah. warehouse that those used to be factories. Textile would, factories. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like textiles. They took our jobs. Yeah. <laughs> we used so, to make things in this country. Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, I think that's the, all these things I didn't think about. And that's what's again, cool about writing a book is you're like, here's the history. I hope you find it interesting. And then people take it in different directions. History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. Ooh, bars. Back to trends happening over there. Yeah. What about trends happening in menswear that you think might, make their way over here soon. I mean, the big fit is, is, has come. Huge has it, pants, definitely a huge, Japanese thing, right? Yeah. Huge pants are a Japanese thing. I think, uh, everything's not as big yet. Like I'm not seeing the really big silhouette Whoa, jackets really? yet. And when we say big fit, we're being like literal, like things that fit large. Very large, yeah. Like, oversized. Like everything oversized. Like the Japanese right. construction pants? No, Ooh. like, I mean, I think the J. Crew baggy fit, is that what they're called? Big, big giant, 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 giant chino. Fit. The giant chino Honestly, not was not close. Yeah, not that big. Not they that could big. Be, yeah, not that big. They and now you're pleat, I might say. Yep. But then you got to match it with the big oversized shirt and the big oversized jacket. And so that I think that is is now... <laughs> Well, they, did a, they do a giant Oxford. They brought that back as well. So yep. it's almost like they're building. We the, can, we can build it and piece, we can build it yeah. bigger. If we build piece it, by come. piece, it's coming. But I think that is coming. I think um, this guy, Ryo Takashima. Do you know him? This guy. I feel like he was a big 
Fitzman. Uh, <laughs> big Fitz guy, but also okay. literally just big, like the big pants and then New Balances was like a thing that he that and, like saw, and like songs oh, yeah, too. Yeah. New Balance, I mean, that that is also key to that look and New Balance is also key to... Uh, like this shit, look at this. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, look yeah, at yeah. this shit. Look at this big ass. That's fucking like fit. that's literally 1996 mall rat. That's yeah. awesome. But he makes it look so good. Um, but Yo, for Takashima, whatever reason, like follow. the New Balance are the shoes for that look. Yeah, for right. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, know exactly is. where A6 that came too. from. Yeah, and Asics is a Japanese company. That is that true. is true. New Balance almost feels like it. It's a. I mean, uh, they're gonna kill me for saying this, but like it feels like a Japanese company because you see them so much in Japan. It's just like it is the basic sneaker. Yeah, right now. I mean, you know, I think they have a dedication to craft that you don't necessarily see out of like the other big, the big, you know, fuck the big three. It's just NB. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that is a rap reference. Okay, let's move on to sure your current book. Yep. That just came out. Twenty twenty two. Okay. Still yeah. still making waves. <laughs> You wrote a book on status and culture. Yep. How much of a nosedive is your status taking by coming on to this podcast? Oh, guys. <laughs> the opposite. Okay. Are, we, are we big in Japan? <laughs> Not yet. Okay. Real heads, no. Yeah. Lang- language, language barrier. Well, yeah. I'm, I'm literally big in Japan at the CP company store. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, like, who you the fuck start is this somewhere. half breed? <laughs> I think, look... I- I think podcasting is is starting to get bigger in Japan, but it's not. Like, radio is really big there, but podcasting right, is right. Is there a menswear radio show currently? Not that, not that I know. Okay. Do you, like, so socialize? aggressive room for also, expansion. I, guys, I think the thing is the throwing fits is a pun that doesn't translate into Japanese. That like, could is this be a some podcast about babies? Yeah. About upset babies? <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Do you socialize with, like, a menswear scene there? Or are you just kind of like, I mean, I know you're, you know, you're a chill guy, but, like. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, no, I mean, I go to parties for menswear brands. Okay. I know. And what do you I have, mean, like, some of it's work. I mean, the, the thing is, like, since I also work in that world. Yeah. I, Welcome I, to our life, bro. Uh, I go to, you know, for professional reasons, you go to events. Networking. And, and, like, I went to a, a, a uh, is this just bragging? But, like, I went to a party <laughs> recently, and, and it's just like, oh, there's the editor-in-chief of Popeye, and I got to talk to him about this mm-hmm. thing. And there's that guy, and we got to talk about this. I don't know. So the United Arrows guy. And the, yeah. And, and um. The fucking Poggy, you know? Yeah, so yeah. I, that yeah. was exactly. So I saw Poggy because he's coming out with a book with Rizzoli. Oh, cool. shit. And he asked me to write an essay for it. Mm. So I was like, I hadn't seen him. I'm like, oh, hey, is the essay cool? La, la. So You ever been to his bar? Oh, I haven't been yet. The, like the secret kind of yes. like He built a bar for yeah, himself yeah, just yeah. to get fucked up by himself. He, <laughs> okay. he did talk. Yeah, I saw something where he just loves drinking, right? Yeah. And, he's like, and uh, karaoke. He... <laughs> He likes me enough to write the essay for his book, but not enough to invite me to the oh, bar. Okay. Maybe once it, the book is published, yes, you could go to the, I'm sure the release party that'll be at the bar for alcoholics. Th- that, that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> What's your reputation like in the Japanese men's wear scene? Uh, I mean, look, this is the other thing. Are you like the, you're the corked up white boy? Uh, so Amator, I wrote in English uh, based on all these Japanese sources and... I wasn't even thinking it would come out in Japan. I don't know really? why. It's really, it's really bizarre. And my <laughs> feeling was like, well, people know this stuff. And right. what happened is it came out and then like no Japanese publishers were that interested in it. And then finally it started getting some buzz in Japan. And then Disc Union, the big record store, they have a publisher and they, they picked it up. And then we serialized it in Popeye for a year. Oh, wow. Um, and when it was in Popeye too, like we weren't getting any feedback and I think it was just in the back of the magazine. No one saw it. So I was like, okay, I don't think this is going to be a thing. Well, the back of the magazine is actually the yeah, front you of the flip magazine. It. Yeah, it's, you got to flip it's it. Exactly. <laughs> uh, it was in the front of the magazine in a bad way. Um, so anyway, the, it came out and it did really well and it's on its eighth printing. Wow. In, Wait, have you sold more books in Japan now than in America? No. And actually the, the number one market for Amatora is China. Whoa, it, oh, let's it sold go, like 30,000 copies. Holy wow. shit, dude. Congrats. Yeah. You guys big in China. Yeah. So, uh, and it, you know, do you know what it's called there? What? No. Because like, they had to retitle it. Because they're all, they're all titled different, but. Because uh, Amatora is a Japanese right. phrase right, for right. American Yeah, and also like nobody cares about the, like Chinese, Chinese fashion market's huge, but nobody cares about American traditional. Mm. So they, they care about streetwear. Right. So they renamed it what translates to Harajuku Cowboy. Fire. That's sick, dude. And I was like, let's not call it that. And he's like, we know what we're doing. And they knew what they were doing. So it, that's... When that's you go to China, China. it's like, yo, look, it's the Harajuku Cowboy. Yeah, that's... Yeehaw, motherfucker. It's uh, a fire nickname. I haven't been yet where anyone said that. But, um, <laughs> and also, Cowboy... You got a chill is, weeb over here. ...is because <laughs> cow, jeans is cowboy pants. Okay. In, cowboy in, pants. Yeah, that's the, the literal translation in Chinese. Well, we're going to steal that expeditiously. Yeah. 
So anyway, so it came out in Japan and it's done well in Japan and people read it and like it, which is incredibly um, gratifying. Right. It's, I mean, that's the ultimate sign, like seal of approval. Or right. right. Or so in, in that sense, like I'm in Popeye, probably one every two or three issues in a nice. club and tight all those things. So I, I'm just trying to be objective. How do, how do you think this? Because like every so often we'll see, you know, an American or a New Yorker, like they, they pop up in Popeye. Popeye has an office here, right? No, but they, they don't? may have a they scout. To. Okay, they don't have an office. Just fucking walking around, like going to like Shy's yeah. Burger pop ups and like finding Mister Mort <laughs> on the street. Like, I I think what happens is they're like, we're going to do a New York issue, and then whoever their scout is okay. is like, how about yeah. these people? And then they kind of well, just some Mordecai Geo tag. Yeah, he's they put an yeah. Apple Air tag on his yeah. on his fucking chinos, dude. <laughs> All, what are the like uh, tropes at Japanese menswear events? Like in New York, it's like, oh, cool, a fucking shitty Italian beer and a vintage car and some fucking. Uh, mahogany wood with some art books. Yeah. What is it in Japan? <laughs> same shit? Uh, pretty much the same. Beer yeah. lasers? They probably have. Oh, beer lasers. <laughs> Fuck with those. Are you saying like a party or the store like itself? An event, like an event. Yeah. An event, they'll have... I don't think it's that different. What's the hors d'oeuvre situation? Just like the like? music will be less punishing. <laughs> okay. How like you can actually less like talk. Less aggro. Yeah. What are the hors d'oeuvres looking like? The hors d'oeuvres are... I don't know. It depends. Okay. I don't, this is a hard question. <laughs> it's, it's not that interesting. Well, James, right. James and I, when we went, when we saw you at the, um, the Victor, was that Victor, Victor pop up? That we, was, or? that was for, what was it for? It was for the cause human made thing, but it was Jupiter. Right. The, the auction site. But, I think that was the part. Oh, at the store, they had, they had imported the beer lasers, which is awesome where they can fucking, yeah. you know, put some cool. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. I love I've that never show. seen No, but I've only seen that here. And they oh, also, really? they also had a whole selection of Suntory whiskeys that yes. I've never seen. Oh really? They're like, oh, dude, would you like this 35 years? Like, yes. American yes, yes, I would. Absolutely. Uh, where I've never been to a party when with that stuff in Japan. American beer technology catch up with Japan where we have those robot pours where we're going to put all uh, bar keeps out of business and just like you put a glass down and yeah. you know. You really want to make more people unemployed in the United States? No, but I would like the perfect Wench, pour. Your wenches are people too, by the That's way. That's true. What's your favorite Japanese beer? If of the big bland four, probably Ebisu. Bland? Ebisu. Excuse like, you. But like the, the craft beers are so good now. And like... Uh, are they all made? They're all made in Japan. They're not yeah, like like, importing like, like Voodoo t- Ranger. <laughs> well, they are. They do. They oh are. my God. They're, they're, they're importing all of the like major craft beers, but then there's Ew. a couple of local, Gross. local companies that are great. But uh, like a 3% or 4% session IPA or whatever, those are incredible. Though. You're an IPA guy? But like these session IPAs aren't have. No, less. I understand. I'm just oh, is that like is that old fashioned? It's a, genera- a generational thing for sure. <laughs> well, you don't fuck with like, like Asahi Super Superdry. Yeah, Super is terrible. What? It's great. Super Dry is good if you Orion, want a beer Orion. with no. Orion's pretty good. A, if you're yeah. in Okinawa, what about a Kirin Ichiban. Kirin Ichiban's good. Okay, so uh, those are fine, but they're just not. Like, sure. What do you call the big bland four? Yeah, like so. Uh, Asahi, Asahi Super Dry. As an alcoholic, support, like, Poggy, I'm offended. Uh, Kirin. Uh, premium malts mm. and Ebisu. So out of those Ebisu, it's, it's the fancy one. What's your Combini order at like when you hit the 7-Eleven or the Lawson or Family Mart? Like a Wilkinson's Club Soda in an interesting flavor. Like mm. a okay. sel- uh, seltzer. Uh, Do you get the, a what? cafe, the cafe la- latte like ice coffee latte that doesn't have sugar in it. Ooh. Oh, they, they, some of them are really sweet. Yeah. Too so sweet. you gotta, you gotta avoid that. Do you um, fuck with the fried chicken there? It's so good. Sometimes like Egg salad I sandwiches. went to the gym and I was like, I'm really hungry and I need something. And they had like the yakitori at the, at the oh, convenience store. And it's like, yeah. that's pure protein right there. Yeah. <laughs> so and it, it, I bet you it fucking slapped too, right? It was delicious. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Like I would, I, I mean, this is the biggest like cliche in the world, but you would not eat the hot dog at a American 7-Eleven. Well, speak well, for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Speak for yourself. <laughs> Present but, company excluded. Yeah. Right. But you eat the yakitori at the the Lawson's or whatever. Yeah, so. dude. But you know, like this is the, the thing best. that is a little annoying is that all of those convenience store chains have standardized all the product. So what used to be cool is you would go to Hokkaido or you go to Okinawa and um, they would have like local delicacies. coffees and all these local local brands. And now it's like you just go to Seven Eleven everywhere and they have the Seven Eleven brand okay. thing. So it's right. it's a little Damn monoculture. Trash. Hmm. fucking globalization. Yep. Well, that's kind of a theme within status and culture, right? Is that if everyone has access to everything, how can one utilize or leverage knowledge information um, because everyone is just like knows the same shit. Yeah. Our question for you is what is W David Marx's 50,000 foot view on clout chasing? 
I mean, cloud chasing is real <laughs> and it's natural and we can't avoid it. It's like human nature. It's human nature. I mean, it's, it's human nature in the society that we're in. Okay. And I don't believe that uh, the great apes have cloud chasing. So let's, let's be let's be clear about that. Right. But uh, <laughs> I, so I, I don't think it's a sin. Like, I, I think people should like not think about okay. these things. It's so, like, oh, that guy's signaling for status. Like everybody's signaling for status. Like if you're not signaling for status, you're also signaling for status. Right? How do you signal for status? Yeah. By writing a book, being like, I know all the shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're, oh, you're doing that? I know what that is. Oh, I literally wrote the book on it, yeah. so I'm good, bro. Yeah, so <laughs> that was my move. Uh, but no, I think everybody's got status moves. There is cloud chasing. It's just, uh, you know, how everyone has a variable sense of how much they want and what they want to do. But my point is that culture kind of comes out of that competition. And some of the competition is good for culture right, right. It's, it's cool like when people were trying to outdo each other when glenn o'brien's trying yeah. to outdo everybody in the 80s be like oh i know this band before you do well, that, and he that, and he did outdo everyone yeah. by the way <laughs> and like and that was good for culture yeah um so i i uh i was the place i'm staying my friend had a copy of madonna's book sex yes which i've not seen in a long time and it's like actually even in our world of hardcore pornography it's actually way more you provocative than i think you, you oh yeah i'm not gonna i'm not gonna state that on the record but <laughs> <laughs> I, was yeah, like, I gotta use whoa. your bathroom <laughs> you're like wow vanilla ice holding madonna yeah yeah. yeah there's a lot of vanilla ice in there which people don't remember but <laughs> yeah, uh, a lot of vanilla ice. <laughs> but the whole thing is like she's referencing maplethorpe and all this right. downtown new york stuff uh, in a way that was really provocative for culture in like yeah, I remember, I, even as a kid, I remember being this huge crazy controversy because yeah. she was like the most famous person in America, and right. she made a porno. Yeah, <laughs> she it was like the most famous person in America who was like, "I'm gonna bring downtown New York, Glenn yeah. Brian, to the masses." And so, uh, like that that kind of thing is like clout chasing at that level. It, uh, and you know, I don't think Glenn O'Brien would say he was cloud chasing; he was above it or whatever. But yeah, just, but he needs to, to find and surface the next cool yeah. thing. Yeah, that's that what no moves stuff forward. And I, like, I think that's the so I'm writing this new book that's a cultural history of the 21st century. Oh, and it's about kind of the failure of All everyone 24 in the 20- years. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wow. Uh, and I'm, it's coming out next year, so there'll be a little bit about okay. 2025 in it. But. Uh, uh, under the dictatorship of uh, Trumpistan. So, uh, how much real estate is podcasting getting in that book? Sorry, how much real estate is podcasting going to get in that book? Podcasting <laughs> will get some real okay. estate. If now you that to, you've mentioned it, yeah. if, you it you quote, if you had to summarize <laughs> the first quarter century, yeah. of the twenty first century, yeah. What are yeah, we, it's what just are we talking a, about, my man? I guess that's the thing is like everyone sold out and everything became so marketed from like the content creation itself became so templated. It's like all these streaming shows are pretty good and they mm-hmm. all have this formula where you're like, yeah, I'll watch another episode. But then you watch the whole thing. You're like, yeah, it's all right. It's B+. Right. Plus. And so everything's a B plus <laughs> instead of people chasing really like I'm gonna do this extreme crazy thing. What about Megalopolis? <laughs> it could like, be. That like could be it. Miss. Sounds like um, that's a, that is a big swing. Yeah. yeah. So big. There's fewer big swings, and but no studio wanted to. He had to finance that movie himself, right? Because yeah. no yeah, one was yeah. like, "This is not going to be." Yeah. And there's just also used to be more stuff where I mean, like I was just writing about um, Chocolate Rain, the Tay on Day mm-hmm. song. Chocolate and, Rain. And so like, okay, so this thing, <laughs> this crazy song is like an internet hit, and and Dr Pepper's like, "You want to do Cherry Chocolate Rain, don't you?" He's like, "Hell yeah!" And like, you know, he sells out in like ten seconds. Right. And so no, there was just Land no sense record. of like. You know what? Cool. I'm just doing this for my people. It's not really for everybody. And and so I think the internet, because the the audience is is immediately global. Yeah. That and if if someone comes to you is like, here's this plate of money, like, (laughs) and no one said no. Everyone's Judas Iscariot. Yeah. Yeah, Listen, we don't fuck with Dr Pepper, but we do fuck with Baja Blast. A PepsiCo product, and if Dr Pepper is also PepsiCo, we fuck with Dr Pepper. I don't think it is. I I think it's Coca Cola. Is it? Yeah. (laughs) I think I think you're thinking Mr Pib. Oh, that is what I'm thinking of. Yeah, uh, we prefer right, so medical professionals. Are you a cultural Marxist? Not in not in Marxism like communism, but like uh, culture is propelled by the machinations of just like economic industry. Economics. This is uh, this can go. This can go really uh, granular. Let's get deep, baby. Uh, I I think like there's a lot of really insight, insightful cultural theory that looks at the role of economics and economic structure and class structure on, 
on the culture that comes out of it. And most certainly in status and culture, I write about how classes battling each other creates mm. culture and creates different aesthetics. So I totally into that. So and believe in that white people stealing from poor <laughs> black people to make culture. Yeah. And, the, and that yeah. part also is that so part. appropriation. I mean, it, and it was a huge change in culture in the 20th century that some white kid would be like, I'm going to get, clout from going to this jazz club that you've mm-hmm. never heard of right instead yeah. of uh, i'm just in this totally elitist white world so, and so coolness was this revolutionary status change right um, right all that is fine the the thing that i'm not like a, a political marxist in the sense that i think all the status stuff exists without even capitalism right mm-hmm. really and so you don't need specifically capitalism to have people vying for status like that's that's a layer under mm-hmm. the economy it's just that capitalism pushes it to certain directions so, to the extremes sorry to the extremes yeah to the extremes or just also to the lowest common denominator and that's the that's the part that's uh, sad and, and the, the thing with ai too that's now, also like, an extreme as south as possible yeah <laughs> so ai and capitals are both pushing things to be as bland and conventional as possible and right. the whole part point of art and the whole point of criticism too, like before this optimism stuff was just be like, let's all celebrate the stuff that isn't lowest common denominator. Mm-hmm. And part of that is, uh, talking shit about <laughs> like stupid cookie cutter sold right. out things. And, and hating, so, yeah, hating <laughs> is critical. <laughs> and, interesting. Interesting. And so like, I th- there became to hear the optimist moment became kind of like, Hey, don't hate on Ashley Simpson just cause she's lip syncing. Right. And so it's like, well, <laughs> It's like, well, what's the point of being a singer if you can't even sing? sing. And then it was like, and and, and I'm writing about this now in the book. It's like, well, then maybe you don't even need a singer. So Paris Hilton is like a pop star who doesn't even sing. Sure. Uh, Stars Are Blind is a fucking (laughs) certified banger. Okay. I will not have any. Give that shit a whole chapter in your book. uh, Stars Are Blind, which you wrote uh, with an acoustic guitar uh, (laughs) as an auteur. No, uh, oh man, I read Paris Hilton's autobiography. Oh wow, how was that? And you know, I think she wants you to think I'm so much more complicated than you think I am, and you do think that, and then you get to the end, you're like, you were the most psychopathic Machiavellian person. Because uh, her whole thing is like, you know, you can't really criticize Paris Hilton because Paris Hilton's like a, it's like a social construct. <laughs> yeah, like, the idea of yeah, Paris Hilton. I'm not, I'm doing a bit, everybody. I'm bigger but, than Jesus. But do you think that there's any sort of backlash to the notion that everything, like you said, is uh, served up immediately to a globalized audience? It can be the biggest thing of the moment. Um, you know, you have movies that are like created in America, but knowing that they need to find an audience in China, so we're not right. going to have any like sex scenes. Do you think there's a backlash that now where it's like, you know, somebody wrote about how Challengers is like such a sexualized movie and you, you don't see that in Hollywood anymore. Or like John Caramonica was saying that kids in fashion now, they don't uh, like they find one thing and they go super deep because they have the information and the access right. to like infinite imagery and infinite references on this like one super hyper specific thing. Right. Do you think there's a backlash to the lowest common denominator of like culture? Yeah, that is happening currently. I Yeah, but it's not really resulting in <laughs> a movement. Like it could. Like I'm, I'm optimistic. I, I do think that we hit some sort of wall with do we want more technology in our lives? And I think people are starting to be like, nah, we're good. Like we, yeah, we, I'm straight. we all got that. all we need. Uh, and AI, I think everyone's like, great. AI is just going to take over culture. And people are like, this is terrible. And mm. so it's going the other direction. I could see it going that way. I mean, I thought Dune was good. Like that. Just it, good? No, it was great. I loved Thank it. Thank you. I loved it. For and, clarifying. And it was, um, but it was also like, it, it was science fiction for adults, right? Well, the, the source the, material is yeah, incredible. Yeah, so like it's, exactly. you know. Uh, so I think there's some good signs and, you know, again, with, with craft culture, with like physical goods, things are moving in the right direction, right? Like mm-hmm. there's more people making high craft artisanal things than ever before in the history of the world sure, probably see so that's all great um but you know like on the thing when did john caramonica say this what did he say uh, a few on? months ago when he was on the pod i don't know yeah. okay so <laughs> like i i think people are going really deep in th- okay so what i worry about is like some kids like oh i really want to know about uh mod culture mm-hmm. so sure. they're like they spend a day learning everything about mod culture and then the next day they're like today i'm learning about oh they move on grunge or whatever and they just move on and then it doesn't really stick and so 
versus the rockabillies that are still 65 years old. Yeah, fucking totally. Rocking I mean, out in Harajuku. It. And, and this is the thing, like, I've also, also been thinking about, which is if you think what is one of the biggest sources of slang these days, it's drag queen culture. Sure. Right? Mm-hmm. And drag queen culture is intense and the people are in it. Yeah. And it's yeah, not dude. easy to be in that world. Slay. And so the. Damn, David is mother. <laughs> yeah, mother's mothering. <laughs> <laughs> so the problem is like if people are skirting around like I'm deep on this today and, and oh there's this uh, I, th- I think I talk about this in the book there's this like wiki aesthetics wiki that's like here's every aesthetic in the world so it's like cottage core it's, yeah or yeah exactly <laughs> and so you can just like bounce I'm like, today, I'm, clone. <laughs> today I'm cottage core and tomorrow I'm cheesehead or whatever it is yeah. and, uh, and is that bad? I, it's from some sort of like uh, graduate thesis, like postmodernism, and, so and that's it's all fast fine. Food, kind of. Yeah, but it it doesn't create the stickiness. And okay. the, the thing we about culture that the the culture that really shows up and people are like, whoa, like we got to pay attention to this because it seems authentic. It's like a group of people isolated who get really into something, and then when they get really into it, it comes out the other end really weird and they seem like we don't care about your mainstream thing we're just doing our thing well so then how do you find things that are like stick to your rib or to use a james term that tickles your pickle like how do you discover stuff yeah i mean it's it's, i don't know if there's a systematic way to do it and then also we all are omnivores too now like there's nobody who's just like i only listen to rockabilly right because you just like what's wrong with you and so like i like dune i like 100 gex (laughs) you know and there's so many people i'm like Hundred gecks are great, and they're just like, "What is wrong with you?" Like, lit- but I'll also yeah. listen to like jazz. Like, I right. listen to jazz. I listen to hundred gecks. It's, it's fine. the notes they don't play, <laughs> and so because of heroin, it's the hyper they don't <laughs> pop. Uh, so it's how do you find stuff? I don't, know. I don't know how to find stuff. No, but, uh, but also <laughs> at a certain at a certain age, are you just like kind of settled into like you're like I like what I like? No, I always I, you're I'm so curious. Bored. I want to be entertained. Oh, okay, so I want things with. Uh, I want things that uh, with stimulus, and I, I would love them to be new. Are and you discovering sad. things through the internet, <laughs> through like Instagram and fucking Twitter holes and shit? You're like never on IG. I feel like you don't really use it. That's I don't this. use it to be like, here's my fit pic. Um, <laughs> well, uh, here's my love, moment. By the way. Okay, so here, here's a really good example. Like, IG is great if you. So I make music, and I like have synthesizers. If you want to find like the weirdest new synthesizers, IG is great because there's like people playing with it. There's the brands themselves being like, here, here's this thing. And then there's all these tutorials of people showing themselves making music that just like you want to put a gun to your head <laughs> because, and that's like, because it, it's all lower, lowest common denominator stuff. Got so it. it's like Instagram can be a discovery mechanism and also can just be the worst of like bland. I'm just going to make things that sound, I'm going to hit a button and it's going to be just like, at your own. Yeah. Could you maybe quickly settle a debate that we've had on this show? Sure. And I'm very curious where you stand on this. Is good taste inherent or can it be learned? Absolutely can be learned. Can it be taught? It can be taught. It can be learned. It, it, so the whole thing is, uh, let me break down good taste for you. It's four, four categories. Oh, First, knowledge. Umami. Oh, knowledge. <laughs> yeah. What did she say? Umami. Sweet, sour. Sweet. That's the oh. sixth day. Right? I thought um, you said sorry. money. No. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so knowledge... And so when you say there's, you know, old money people who have good taste, it's because they grew up and it's just around them. Like they don't have to learn it. The osmosis. It's, is just it's the there. osmosis. Um, they know how to talk. They know how to move. They know how to wear all that. But you can learn that knowledge. The second is what I call uh, what am I, uh, congruence so that, that everything fits together. Like you got to know not only what are the brands or what, what are the things, but how do they fit together? So you could be somebody who dresses this way, but the car is going to kind of also Damn. match the home. And like, you, you shouldn't be living in a hovel and they have a Porsche outside, right? right. Like it's all going to work. You should be, uh, uh, rolling your Remova back to 36 J yeah. or right. wearing your rent. Right. Cause right. you have no bed frame. Right. Uh, the third is some sort of originality. Okay. Like you got to break out at some point, but that's like late in this, the game. Like mm-hmm. you want to learn as much as you can and then you want to do one own. little move yeah. where people are like, oh, that's Iterate. new. Yeah. And then the fourth is authenticity, which is that it, mm-hmm. at the end of the day, it's got to tell your story. And then like, I think that's a formula for good taste. And that could mean the good taste comes from like someone could be really into hip hop and have great taste and someone could be really into streetwear. Someone could be really into prep. Like you, you, there's not a world in which there's one good taste now. Right. Mm. There's a lot. Thank God. But it can be taught, but you have to, you also, 
it's a long process. Yeah. That like getting through all four of those takes a journey years. without a destination, you might say. Exactly. And so, I mean, the, the thing that people, I think the United States and Japan, one big difference is in like take bands. Like I think when I was growing up being in like garage bands is immediately you'd be like, I need original material. And in Japan, it's like, well, we're going to be a Radiohead cover band for five years. Right. And then at some point we'll do, do other things. And, uh, I think if you're like a young kid trying to learn how to dress well, like don't try too hard to pull off. Like I'm going to do this new thing. Like just <laughs> learn the basics. Keep your head down. I'm with these right. jeans as a shirt. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I saw then, that in Soho. It was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and someone, someone who can pull that off can maybe pull it off. No, but you, but you can't. Certain things can't you know, so, so you, you could pull the jeans off of your arms and wear them properly. Maybe you can wear the jeans like a, as a Cowboy sweater. Pants. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I don't know. But the point is like, just don't uh, a, try so hard to be yeah. original. And so you got to fuck up. You got to yes. fall down yeah, to get yeah. back up. I agree with that. I get knocked so anyways, down. I think get the, back up again. It's, I think it's the Chumbawamba. 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 <laughs> philosophy is actually what informs all good taste. They wow. did not do that song just to make the money. They did the song for the philosophy. Dude, but yeah. uh, I drink a vodka drink. Yeah. I, I drink a whiskey drink. Yeah. I look, I, so I think taste can absolutely be taught, but you gotta, you gotta Damn. have the capacity to learn. That's right. a tub thumping yeah. answer, my friends. Yeah. Thank you. I want to ask you a question about arguably one of the most tasteful men in modern society. Nigo. Yeah. How do you start working with Nigo? Um, so I wrote my senior thesis in college about a bathing ape. Wow. And this was <laughs> in 2001. And, uh, <laughs> So Is that I, just an excuse to like wear buy and wear babe? <laughs> well, no. So in, in 98, I was in Tokyo and I discovered babe and I was like, well, and just on a personal level, I was like, this okay. is so cool. But I went back to school and I was talking to my professors and I was like, oh yeah, this crazy thing. I waited in line three hours to buy a t-shirt and, and they were like, oh, that's your thesis. Oh shit. And I'm like, I can't, guys, I can't do this as my thesis. <laughs> it's just it's gotta be bro. boring. Yeah. Um, and everyone was really supportive and I got like a scholarship to go sick, like do the research. And so I showed it back up in 2000 and did a, a bunch of research and I had, mm. uh, I had asked Nigo for an interview and he was just out of town or something. And so he couldn't do it. Sure. 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 And, sure. sure. Um, oh yeah. I'm busy that weekend. Yeah. I <laughs> know. Oh, I'm also busy that other weekend. <laughs> and so, uh, Oh, also just a sidebar in 99, uh, this was a time in, in young people will not understand this, but no brands had web pages. In yeah. 1999. So I had made with this guy, Mark, the first unofficial bathing ape web page. Wow. A fan page? A wow, fan page in 1999. Dude. But that was the only thing on the internet that looked authoritative about a bathing ape. What was and the so, traffic looking like? Yeah. I don't know. It, and it was hosted on my university server, Hit which is funny. But like New York Times, and you can go read this article from 99, they wanted to write about bathing ape. And so they, they couldn't get anyone on the record about it and so they called me and i was like yeah i'll, t I'll, do I'll take <laughs> yeah. this interview i'm the expert <laughs> so i did this interview and i'm quoted in the piece and then stash and futura who ran recon which was like mm -hmm. the only store that sold it were just like who the fuck do you think you are and at the time i was like wow it's kind of scared of them but uh it was, yeah, like, what was I doing? That was like Scarcity a really... Scarcity makes the heart grow yeah. fonder. And that's like an amazing article because it's like right, the artist gonna... Rostar is quoted in it and Eric Vatek, who does Capital. You have a lot of capital. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. You're, Marks. You're 20 years old. Yeah. Um, uh, you, you told your story about a bizarre shopping trip to buy a simple $48 t-shirt, which in 1999 dollars, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, finally, you're able to buy a shirt with an ape and the company's motto, ape shall never kill ape. Do you sell right. this t-shirt? I do, and it's like... Woo! I have some a, sentimental. Shit. I have a lot of vintage streetwear pieces in the basement, and but some of them have just like gotten these weird stains that you can't get out anymore, and I don't know what they mm, are. It's gross. Ape, uh, ape cum. There's a definite. <laughs> there's a definite attempt to confuse the public, said Mr. Marks, twenty, who set up an unofficial bathing ape website when yes. he was turned to Harvard for his junior year. He posts updates on where to find bathing ape clothing, buying tips, and explanations like, "quote Nigo is the president and director of the label, but it is unclear whether he actually designs any of the clothes." Ooh, Mr. Yeah. Marks said. Shot. It's like this secret society and there's not that much info about it. And this is totally my misinterpretation of, of everything. So the, so this is kind of Japanese street in a nutshell, right? This isn't just yeah. bathing ape. And like I, but the main point was like, I was just looking online and online, this is like a desert in, in you know, the online. This is pre-Google or... Which by the way, Japanese brands, it's still kind of hard to like find... 
yeah. their websites like intelligible. But then it was basically like four websites that's something about baiting right. apes. So we were just piecing together what we could find. I was wrong. And anyway, I felt very uh, paranoid. It was what I'd say that like they were out to get me for what I'd done. And so uh, I got to interview Nigo in 2006 for Nylon Guys. <laughs> nice. Nylon for guys. Uh, and that Big went pretty rip. well. And then I kind of got in with his people. So did he know you at this point? He knew you as like I don't, the, I don't, I don't think the so. guy I don't, who's I don't obsessed even, with babe. I hope he doesn't listen to this because I don't even know don't if he knows he... that about me now. Um, <laughs> but uh, uh, Breaking news. I had done, I guess like when when I was doing Amatora, I went to his people and said, would he be interviewed? And he ended up not being interviewed, but he was, he was supportive of the project. Okay. And then when it came out, I think he had read it or uh, was familiar with it. And then I got to meet him a couple of times. And then- Oh, Harajuku like, Cowboy. Yeah. <laughs> and then like the third meeting they were like oh do you want to join the board of directors for human made which uh, i did not expect uh, that was gonna was yeah. gonna happen so i joined the board last year and the otsumo um, overlord and it's it is it's an honor to yeah. have that journey so is there something about nico uh, nico excuse me that would uh surprise people now that you know him personally and i mean he, in he, his employ? he is i mean i think people know he's quiet and uh, he just doesn't miss, <laughs> you know. I mean, I don't well, know. Well, he did miss an opportunity to take a photo with us at uh, that. Event. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. That, oh, was, fuck. that was uh, embarrassing. <laughs> I I think that he, whatever you think of like his uh, depth of knowledge, it's beyond right. that. Like that's unfathomable. That's the thing that like always blows me away. Which is like, yeah, he got some five hundred ones or whatever, but it's like, no, he's right. got everything. And and he's it got the five hundred twos. Like I was there, and we were talking about the Simpsons or something. He's like, hold on. He's like, I've got all the DVDs. Look, you know, oh, so it's like whatever What's you're his favorite into. Season? <laughs> don't know about that one, but like whatever you're Six. into, he's <laughs> way more into that. Yeah, uh, and it's it's does, kind of exciting. He, is is it kind of like low-key annoying that he's like he knows everything? But he sometimes he somehow or he's just the nicest guy. Off. Be he honest, is, he's nice. Yeah. Can he go speak English? I think he can. I don't know if he can because I've translated for him before. Right. So right. It's, since my official capacity was to speak English for him, um, I think he understands probably more than he. Okay. So, so he could have listened to the he, podcast. He's like show, yeah. he's like Shohei Otani in that respect. <laughs> I have not seen Otani in the interviews, but he, Otani does not speak English, right? No, but I'm pretty sure he can like mm. understand more than yeah. maybe he's yeah. like letting on. I mean, in, in general. No one got my, uh, by the way, my Ipe Otani reference when I said, oh, he's a Japanese translator, bet. Oh, Whatever. I didn't get it either. Wow, dude. See, Whatever. honestly, this is why you I'm not pizza, embezzled bro. $40 million. No, you have okay. it. On, on the record, let me just, delete just that make 20 question. 20 million yen. Um, so in your capacity as a translator for Nigo, who's the craziest person you've been a go between, um, between I Nigo did it twice. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. So you're not sorry. like asking Yeet to take his shoes off when he comes into the house. No, I, I like, uh, Nigo's got another personal assistant, Dan, right. who, who doesn't who does. steal money and place bets. Yeah. Right. Got it. Right. Got it. He's, he's, he's the one mostly who does all that okay. work. I was just brought in for two specific interviews. Has there been a piece of wisdom or advice that you've gleaned off of Nigo that is like really stuck with you as like the best uh, thing that you're able to absorb via osmosis from him? I mean, the, the thing that I've realized recently in working with Human Made is everything I know about taste kind of comes from him and how yes. he ran Babe. And so I'll sometimes be like, Hey, that's a good idea or that's a bad idea or whatever. And before I could express it, he would express the same thing. And it's like, oh, because all my thoughts are just stolen from you. So <laughs> I've been accepted. Yeah. So I, I do like, I don't think it's one thing. It's just, I, I think. Yeah, and the world has been incepted by Nigo in the sense of like, I mean, listen to he's like some type of Corel or someone taste. talk yeah, about yeah, yeah. it. Yeah, you know, Kanye, it's like you don't need me to to, to say this. Mm -hmm. um, he doesn't need me to say this, but uh, he really got something about what Stussy was doing, but then extended it into this whole other world. And you know, and I'm writing about this in the new book too. But like Japanese streetwear infected the hip hop world and then infected. Well, infected makes it sound like a disease. Or something. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Well, Japanese Inspire. streetwear. Inspire. Yeah. Japanese then. streetwear is at the heart of the Wayne clips beef. Right. Right. Which right. Then became Drake push, which that became Drake Kendricks, you know? So like, right. Shit it all goes back to Nico. 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 all back to Nico. They always want to blame a fucking POC. Yeah. For real. Uh, so <laughs> no comment on that. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, so like I, I think that his approach to taste and commerce and how they merge, like yeah. every, everyone's been paying attention, has has inherited his ideas on it. Do you do you think? I mean, I guess you're not on TikTok, but like, 
You don't know. Do that. kids do the do the Zoomers and Gen Z like do they appreciate and know like Nigo's influ- his level of influence? I don't know. Probably not, right? Because like it, no. it did start in like the late nineties. I think you got to be a millennial or geriatric millennial to understand him as the cultural barometer, right? Yeah, I mean, this as the source. I guess it's like, yeah, do true. you care if like Pharrell knows? Well, you know, if, if or, they're looking at okay, if they're looking at Virgil, right, as like yeah, the god, and Virgil right? knew you know? absolutely, yeah, and, and, and who did he kind of you know not like was inspired by or learned from Nigo? Yeah, right. The who family did, tree's roots are Nigo. Totally, yeah. but and it's and I don't know. I mean, I think about this like Michael McLaren or something, <laughs> like with somebody who, you know, none of this stuff starts without him either. Sure, like, right. do, does a twenty-two year old know who that is? Probably not. Like, but that's okay. They Sex, can learn baby. about him. In, they can learn about <laughs> him in twenty minutes on Wikipedia, though. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, an and, and that's the thing. And and that was the kind of knowledge and name dropping. Go and watch the filth of the nineties. He's the bad guy in that movie. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, he had a store called Sex. Yeah. For those yes. Check it out. But he had a store. Not to be confused with Madonna's book. Before yeah. <laughs> before Sex, it was Let It Let It Ride. And then before that, it was um, Let It Rock. Sorry. And then it was called Too Fast, Too Fast to Live Too Young to Die. Mm. And that's where this Japanese brand cream soda ripped off the logo. Isn't there also not Wacko Maria, but another Japanese brand that's kind of rooted in like American motorcycle culture that I think uses that logo, or at least they have it like up on their wall. Yeah. Bounty Hunter? It's, it's yes. Mm. Or neighborhood, maybe? Neighborhood. Yeah. Neighborhood. It's their live, laugh, love, or, you know, rose all day. It's just- <laughs> yeah. No, so like that, that all comes from McLaren. Like streetwear right. in Japan, it's a mix of, it's like McLaren doing the anti hippie rockabilly thing that becomes sex, that becomes punk, that becomes seditionaries. Right. And then that inspires Hiroshi Fujiwara and then Stussy comes in. And so it's kind of like a mix of the American surf skate stuff plus the British right. street stuff. Where did McLaren get his shit from? Oscar yeah. Wilde? Like, is he just fully original? I think he was pretty original. And there's a big debate about like, you know, he and Vivian Westwood were together. Right. And then in his old partner, there's like this real beef. You should read about it. And I don't, I can't tell you what's true, but there's this whole thing where like, well, Vivian had all the ideas and he ripped her off. And wow. then now McLaren's former, I don't know if their wife or girlfriend is like, no, no, no. Vivian ripped him off. It was all his ideas. So there's a big, there's a big beef between them. No, this reminds me of a little bit of a gnome de guerre type situation. Ooh. I don't, I don't know. The store in New York. That okay. Was, uh, I don't know. Anyway, I know the store, but I, I don't, don't want to the, talk yeah. about people's personal lives. Yeah. yeah. You brought it up. More than I already did. Right. <laughs> I know. I was hoping that you could speak for me. Anyway, well, moving on. Well, David, your last act in this trip to America is you come on to the only podcast that matters. Yep. But when you do make your way back here, what's the first thing you simply must do besides go to Target and buy some socks that fit? Literally, and I've done this twice now, so it's a pattern. I get out of JFK. I get on the air train. Yeah. I get off at Grand Central, Mm -hmm. and I walk to Sarge's, the Jewish deli. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time I got a Reuben. Last time I got, I think it's called Sarge's Favorite or something, and it's brisket with gravy and applesauce on the potato lockies. And I got to get that. So I like I, Jewish, Jewish deli, deli food, food not, not big in Japan is right not available in Japan. So really? Got, That's one that they haven't like, perfected. A, yeah, exactly. Smoked and like, meats. <laughs> why was it? Why is in sons or something? One of the San Francisco ones had opened a chain and then it didn't work. And it, but there's got to be good barbecue in Japan. No, the, the barbecue is getting better. And I can also do, I've gotten pretty good at, at doing ribs and oh, nice. pork. Oh, nice. So that's all fine. What about bagels in Japan? What's the status? Bagel, on? There's one place in Shirogane that does good bagels, but like literally one. There's like a bunch of chains and they're terrible. Okay, yeah. but they're, they're not as good in New York. Japan. Sorry, there's Essa Bagel in Japan. But I don't think those are good. I don't, I'm not saying it's good. I'm just yeah. saying they just there's license like, the yeah, name exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's like North uh, Face purple label. <laughs> No, but Jewish deli, like like a good corned beef, hard to have. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, So I gotta have Jewish deli food and and an egg egg cream. Mm. (laughs) I can make an egg cream, but it's 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 fun. It's not the same. I had a root beer float the other day. That was fun. So (laughs) all that kind of stuff. So uh, you eat like a child. Yeah, Yeah, totally. (laughs) I gotta eat that food and then I get on a plane. But that's about it. I mean, like the other thing too is I was in I think I was in Paris last year or in london and i was kind of trying to think like what could you not even get in japan like what brand and, and you know drake's actually it's like hard to get in japan Ooh, you know? that's so, surprising yeah and I, that's some weird quirky thing but so like going to drake's is fun in london because it's like well i can't get this mm-hmm. in in japan but like almost everything's available in right. japan and then i in the last 20 years have figured out how to do like every single food that i want to eat and so 
like, okay, I want to do red beans and rice. So my dad's from New Orleans, so I, I, I can cook a lot of that stuff. So like, okay, I want to make red beans and rice. Well, I got to get the ham hock. Well, there's no ham hock, <laughs> but I can find the one Vietnamese grocery that's selling the ham hock that right. I can go and then salt it myself or whatever. So I, like, I, I now have, I culture my own buttermilk. Wow. Oh, wow. For example, you're a fucking good old boy. Yeah. So I bring the <laughs> south to exactly to the east. So I can do all that now. I found That's the one place exchange. with uh, baby. Dude, red why ribs. do you open up a fucking soul, southern soul food spot in Japan? You kill it. Hey, Go yeah. crazy. Never say never. Bro. Yeah, and they'll let you do blackface over there. <laughs> I yeah no. <laughs> that is I have seen that. It is. Yeah, we quite talked disturbing. about that on the like the Louis Armstrong clip yeah. that goes viral, or James went to it. What do you Stevie Wonder? Who's Stevie Wonder? I'm yeah. feeling that that is. There's there's a reduction in blackface, but I think it's probably, thank God it should be zero, and I don't think it's zero. Yet. Right, it's not zero. What do you miss about when you're here? What's the thing you miss most about Japan? Not having to worry about my physical safety. Oh, that's a Shit. good one. Okay, that's a good one. Yeah, All right. nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> um, for guys and girls lucky enough to go over there. Yeah. And by the way, the most fucking guy jeans. I've ever seen in Japan. And and this is like, you know, it's definitely like record, you know, setting tourism after COVID. Yep. The week ass yeah. I think I think literally April was the, the highest wow. number ever. It's nuts. What is the biggest mistake or faux pas you see foreign tourists make when they're visiting Japan? Being really loud. Yeah. I'm fucked. Being really loud on the yeah, train. Yeah, can't go there. Um <laughs> and American. dressing way too casually oh really just like like slutty like Slobby? short shorts don't show don't show your stomach don't show your arms don't show your toes probably not yeah so pretend you're in the middle east i wouldn't go that far but just <laughs> dress respectfully have you had like i don't know where you live in tokyo necessarily but like have you had any local haunts like ruined because the fucking honkies start getting started coming okay through? so for a long time that was not an issue because everybody goes to this list uh, if you got to go to Shibuya, you got to go to Harajuku, you got to go to Akihabara, you got to go to Ginza. So if you just kind of avoid those places and the main strips, usually we're fine. Yeah. And then because of TikTok and Instagram and all these travel vloggers, mm -hmm. I went to this, there's this um, totally mom and pop uh, cafe called Hekaloon that is between Taranamon and Shinbashi. You would not go there unless you knew about it. And literally it was only neighborhood people. You walk in and it has a sign that says, for smoking cigarettes, uh, smoke up to three, please. It's like that. <laughs> it's that kind of place. Like you can go there, you can smoke three cigarettes and then get out. And they have a pudding, the jumbo pudding. And someone on one of these sites, and I don't know if it was in China or it was TikTok, uh, but they posted, here's this pudding. And then there, now there's like a line every morning, uh. 50 tourists trying to get the pudding. And so if you go <laughs> after they've run out of the pudding, it's back to normal. Like no one's okay. there. Yeah. But like the, in the proprietor, the hours. it's like 75. And I was like, what, what happened? He's like, I don't know. Uh, he's like, it's fine. I don't, it's, it's good. I'm, I'm happy for like anyone to, to come here, but, uh, I don't know. I don't even have a smartphone. Jesus. But so like, it's starting to creep into, you just can't go to a couple of really great places Bummer. because the tours and because the other thing too, you have to understand is a great establishment, like a cafe or restaurant in Japan has like 10 seats. Right. Yeah. So if, if a hundred thousand people see it on TikTok. And You're then fucked. like ten percent go, like it's You're done. Yeah. Fucked. It's a wrap. So that so there, I I I just wrote uh, for the Atlantic about yes the end of cultural arbitrage, and it used to be that like if you knew the place, you would get credit for like telling everybody. But now it's like, well, I'm gonna get clout, but I'm gonna ruin it. Yeah. So you got to balance it out, and so the double think, edged sword. So now there's like this term, get, like gatekeeping is back, yeah. and so the idea is like don't tell people about your yeah. favorites. And I think in Japan, you, we are at a point where you have to. I also think that be careful it, it, in Japan. Like everyone, the mistake that. I think people make is like finding the best sushi. Like that doesn't exist. Oh, that, like, that was the one other thing I was going to say, which is everyone shows up. was like, I got to eat this tonkatsu place. And I got to eat this ramen place. It's like, they're all good. <laughs> yeah. They all like, fucking slap, like in America, the you floor will have here. a bad meal. The yeah, floor like, in Japan is here. You will, it's not a ceiling. Have, you will not have a bad meal. And so you tonkatsu, like 99% of the ones you go to will be good enough for you and just go <laughs> and don't line up. At this no, one no. That you go to. Yeah. My advice is uh, go to any place that doesn't have any English reviews on Google. <laughs> yeah. And it's going to be good. Yep. And just point at the menu and just be like that. Or use Google Translate camera. I mean, you know? it, it is really just like the curse of tourism in that everybody's chasing authenticity. And then by everybody chasing authenticity, it makes the places inauthentic. And so mm. it's just the par it's that paradox. But I had not felt that way for a long time. And, and the economy needs the support. I don't, 
as somebody who is a guest of a country, I think it's incredibly snobbish to be like, well, I'm here, but you can't come. Sure, right. So like, I think people should go to Japan and that's fine. It's just for the first time in the last 18 months, I felt like, okay, this is actually creeping into my yeah. lifestyle. Not to be presumptuous, but at this point now, you've oh, it's been over 20 years, right? And yeah. you adopted home. My question for you, David, do you ever dream in Japanese? I don't dream in Japanese. I curse in Japanese. Like when Ooh. I'm driving and someone cuts me off, I'll like my mind will just go to. Oh, like, really? No, but no one yeah. cuts you off in Japan. Come on. What are some good Japanese curses that you can just drop for us right now? I don't know if I'm going to do that. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> uh, there's no, no one cuts oh, you off. But, oh, for she's go. but for example, there's <laughs> like all the streets in my neighborhood are what you would consider in the United States one lane. Yeah. And they're two way. Yeah. And so like, there's a long street where if I go in mm -hmm. and then someone on the other side's coming in, like one of us has, it's like chicken you, and you back up. And so that guy backs up. And so right. I'm always like, so in the morning as I'm driving, uh, the, there's always this SUV that comes from the other side. Every time it's like, oh, you again. You haven't learned like the first 25 times David, that I'm SUV? here first. <laughs> yeah. It's fucking crazy. And also like I, I curse all the SUVs because the roads are so small. Like yeah. get, get this a hatchback. Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> yeah. Get a hatchback because if you've got a Range Rover that you don't need in the streets of Tokyo, yeah. uh, you're just Get a motorcycle, out. dude. Yeah, yeah, Join a gang. Yeah. So, oh, I, there was a, there, this is, this is kind of a sidebar, but I, I got, there was, I was somewhere like at a corporate retreat thing and they had invited an ER doctor to tell us about like working under stress. Cause he has like these 20 hour days where he can't even go to the bathroom or whatever. And I was like, Oh, sorry. I know this is a little off topic, but you've been in the ER for decades. What are the like behaviors you shouldn't do as a person? <laughs> and he was like, Oh, um, don't drink too much. Don't do drugs. Don't, dr don't be on a mo motorcycle ever. One out of three ain't bad, Lawrence. Woo! Um, You'll never catch me on a motorcycle, folks. I'll tell yeah. you that much. <laughs> what what's I thought? What I found remarkable the last time I was there was uh, I I was there for two weeks and I counted the number of times I heard a, a car horn beep on one hand. Oh yeah, insane. <clears throat> so this is a, this is a great example of also of why not to like essentialize a culture because people are like oh yeah in Japan everyone's so polite no one beeps. I was reading some book about Tokyo in the fifties and it, it was like everyone is on their horn at all <laughs> times. So like at some point they just basically told everybody stop doing stop. that and it stopped. <laughs> but it's not like some essential Japanese trait that really you know, people don't beep the horns. It's just that now the convention is you don't beep your horn. Okay. David. I'm always very slow. I'm always like that guy cut me off two minutes ago and then I like yeah, yeah, later. Yeah. Delayed, yeah, rage. Can't, can't take the <laughs> can't take the Pensacola out of the boy, <laughs> David. How much money do you make? I, it's funny. I heard you ask somebody that last time. I was like, do people answer that question? No, never. Well, never. The sometimes. Yeah, it depends. I don't know when this comes out, but uh, we got some good answers recently. Yeah, like tell me, tell me what's a good answer that's not just like well, a lot, lot. A dollar figure. The best answer I thought was uh, our boy Rob YC. Mm -hmm. He is a black man, and he's like, well, I work in film and television. And I'm going to tell you what I make. Because right, right. I know what I know that what I make is good, and this is what you should make, whatever the color of your skin is. But I know that you know um, POCs they get taken advantage of where right. they're like underpaid for their labor. So he actually gave us an accurate uh, yeah, answer. That's interesting. We're like, yo, that's cool. Yeah. Um, another guy just said I make a shitload of money, and that was cool too. I like yeah, that. Look, this the, this is how I'll spin it: is <laughs> that um, if you're a young aspiring author or cultural critic or someone who wants to make money on culture, know that there is no money on culture. <laughs> and when you see people who are living these baller lifestyles and they're authors, that it's not from the books. What's it from? It's from trust funds mm. or it's they have, on it. or they have secret jobs. And so the thing is I had, I had a job I didn't talk about for a long time, which is I worked at Google and that pays a lot. That was your secret and job. And that, that finance, that was I, like, my motto was be your own trust fund. So Ooh, it's like, ours. you know, work the real job and then take the money and to, uh, pursue your hobbies or, you know, pursue your passion is a, a nicer way to say it. But like I wrote the books uh, while I had a full time job. Wow. Now, oh, did shit. I totally burn myself out doing that? Yeah. Uh, and I quit. Like you worked in the ER or some shit, <laughs> you might say. <laughs> but it's like I wake up, I write for two hours, I would do a full day's work. I would come home and then right. like I had consulting things on the side, too. So I, I went too far and I went kaput. And I think that like I've been burnt out. Try, and I quit in order to like take freelance and, mm -hmm. you know, have this board seat and have this new job uh, that's a 50% role. So I'm like trying to find the right balance. But uh, I think what's important is 
that this whole industry is built on a fantasy of this lifestyle and you see people's apartments and stuff and you're like, how do they afford that on right. doing this thing that doesn't see, I don't understand what the revenue is. Um, now if you are on Patreon or Substack or something and, and those things, uh, have revenue streams, then there actually is revenue or something. Right. But I like, I make a little money from my books every year and it's nice and it pays for, I think the labor, but it's not enough. If you see photos of me, my house that did not buy the house. You know? Right. 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 Have you ever been tempted besides the work for Google and YouTube? Have you ever been tempted to sell out? Has anyone come to what you with is- a plate of money? I don't know. You're because you talked about how like selling out is just like such an instantaneous, uh, you know, no one gives a second thought now. It is the norm, right? Has anyone come to you and be like, yo, I'll give you this fucking huge bag if you come write copy for Shein or something? I think the people, the brands that come to me, like I worked for Beams Plus and Comic Crush Shirts, and like nice. I love them. And so oh. it's like, yeah, I'll, I will take the money and have fun with it. So I, I like, you, weren't, you weren't paid and in, in made to measure shirts, is what you're saying. No, I mean I was paid. <laughs> I was paid money, and we so, took the money, and you bought the main shirts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically, it's kind of yeah. It's it's I'm, a, cycle. I'm a good, I'm a good customer of those places <laughs> anyway. But I, like I, because I do this very specific thing, the brands that appreciate that thing, we're in the same wavelength, and sure. so when they come to me with work, it usually fits. So there hasn't been um, anyone who's come to me where I'm like, okay, this is just sellout. Right. work. I've been, I've been blessed in, in that sense, but also none of that pays enough to live right, the baller right, lifestyle. Right. So anyway, so like it's young kids pay attention, ask hard questions. Where are these people's money coming from? And and the thing too is like Daddy. being, you know, you asked about good taste and you, you know, status and culture. The, some of the reason I wrote that book is to democratize that knowledge, because if you grow up in a rich family, you know this stuff. Yeah. Right. And if you didn't, you don't. And then you get out in the world and you're like, why am I like so rich getting advantage? richer? What the yeah. fuck? Yeah. Dude? And so knowing this stuff is a is, Roth IRA, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a Jewish IRA, <laughs> a Jewish IRA. <laughs> it's, uh, it's important to know these things. And so anyway, so I think, uh, and I, I contribute to it by having a corporate job and not talking about it and right. pretending like, oh, I'm just a menswear influencer. I'm just a guy. Uh, and it's not true. It's like you have to have a real job. So the real jobs pay real money and that is important for things like uh, college education savings sure. and uh, paying mortgages and retirements and mm-hmm. very adult things. Besides these really adult things, what do you like to spend your hard-earned money on? And, and besides synthesizers. I, yeah, synthesizers. I buy some... Yeah. I'm not like... I, I'm not a... I don't have a collector mindset, which is like the people were like, see this guitar. This is a $57,000 guitar. You can't play it. <laughs> don't even look at it. You know, like that spinal tap thing. Um, <laughs> I like buying stuff. That's a tool to do a thing. So like if I buy a synthesizer, I'm going to use, I'm going to use the You're synthesizer. You're a doer. Yeah. I, I, You're a wearer, a doer, I buy a books. Synther, I buy books to read the books. Okay. And like sometimes I buy a lot of used books because I don't, it, as long as the words are legible, that's all I care about. Like, I don't, right. I just, I'm not a freak about, I don't put anything on ice. Okay. Right. You're a user. Yeah. I use stuff. So uh, I believe it's uh, the term, uh, wear your kicks, kids. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So uh, I spend, I spend money on pretty, Adult I, mean, I, I built stuff. a house. That, uh, building a house is expensive and takes yeah, time. Sure. That, so I did that. But like uh, on the small stuff, I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm on the stingy side of okay. anything. Yeah. Respect. Right. Good Southern boy. David, as someone who is literally an expert on menswear, status, culture, culture, we would love to tap into that big brain of yours yeah, real for quick. just the last question we have for you. <coughs> when the only podcast that matters. Do you, a user, a doer, a maker, creator, a craftsman, <laughs> do you have any constructive criticism you would like to give to us? Yeah. Free 99 consulting. Let's uh, let's start with the good. <laughs> oh shit! Here we go. Which is <laughs> that's all the time we have, folks. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> uh, I mean, uh, starting with fuck yeah menswear, oh, well. and it's like a, a lineage that goes to today. It's that you took this thing that is nascent, like young energy menswear, and you made it your own. Mm-hmm. And it's a unique voice. And I do feel like if you're going to do something, only do it if it's a unique voice. Facts. Um, there is, this so is don't the only, even bother starting a podcast. This is the only podcast morons. that matters. <laughs> but it's also like it's the only podcast that's like this. Right, sure. Right? And I, so I think that's what really matters. 
and you're very kind to a lot of guests who are not as aggro, mm. right? And so that don't deserve our kindness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I like I don't have any negative feedback. Ooh, I love appreciate it. that. Uh, 90 minutes is a lot to ask from people. Oh, it's an hour 45. Yeah, hour 45. Yeah. But it flew by, I'm sure. But then also people are like, oh, I just listened to you know 1.5 speed. Like, it's, it's such nah, a dehumanizing that's crazy. experience. That's crazy. We, we yeah. hear that from some listeners, and I just don't, especially because of the agroness of this show sometimes. I'm like, I don't know how or why you would yeah. torture yourself. That's some Guantanamo Bay level shit. Yeah. To those listening at 1.5x right now, why would you do that to yourself? <laughs> yeah. You fucking moron, what are you doing? Like, I, I think modern society creates so much anxiety and there's nothing more anxiety <laughs> dri- dri- uh, driving than like listening to news at 1.5 X oh. and just like, uh, so, uh, I don't know. I so don't chop know. and screw us. Uh, yeah. Listen to us at 0.5 X. Yeah. About that. Slow it down. Shout yeah. out H-town. Uh, no, it's, it's great. I Thanks, love, buddy. I love the diversity. It's Appreciate just like it. bring, bring something new and you cool. bring something new. Well, look, man, um, if, uh, Audion wants to start <laughs> up the podcast marketing, uh, segment, wants to fly us out to Japan, bang my motherfucking line. Where can the kids follow you? And what would you like to plug? I'm going to plug, uh, by, the books, Amatora, How Japan Saved American Style. Amatora, that's like a, a you need <coughs> to buy that. That is a must have for and it's any. Fun. It's a foundational it's, text. Yes. And it's not. If you listen to the show. It's like a, it's a history. It's breezy. Status and culture, not breezy. <laughs> I know. I got the feedback. Who the fuck wrote this shit? <coughs> I got the feedback. But it has kind of. sociologist? Kinda, <laughs> it kind of has the secrets to society if you want to know them. So they're in there. But it's um, a brainier read. Yeah. It's definitely a brain. It's a slower brainier read. Don't try to read it like all in one sitting it's taken taken chunks okay uh i have a newsletter at culture.ghost.io oh how frequently also, are, you, are you yeah that's the thing come on i dude. get i get well because i'm writing a book now and so it's like i get sucked into writing the book rather than doing my newsletter so mm. i haven't done something in about a month but i try to do something every two weeks but it's right. bad um and then otherwise i'm on x formerly known as twitter and instagram what are your handles tell the people w david marks got it all right W. David March, thank you. For thank you. On to the a only living podcast legend. matters for this lively, spirited, honestly, and again, I hope people had their pens out and were yes. fucking jotting down and taking notes like this was a college lecture because this shit was big brain tier podcasting a at so 1x long. or 1.5x. Yeah. Chef, take us out. 